Welcome to tonight's live chat. Thanks for hopping on. We've got a lot to talk about. It is hot, it is humid, and this is the weirdest honey flow that I've seen this time of the year. But it seems like every year there's always something odd going on. So is there such thing as a normal year? I think that's a valid question. We're going to be taking lots of questions and answers tonight. Well, we'll be taking lots of questions, trying to give answers. We're also going to be talking about the conference, some of the crazy stuff that's been going on. We've got that new extraction system. We're working on getting that all leveled out and in place. Crazy, crazy stuff. And if you are coming to the conference, we should have all that information out and available to where people can start signing up in about four weeks. It's going to go quick. And we're, we're trying to find a place that has a little bit more room, but I still feel like uh, it's going to go probably within a, a month or so. So at the, the longest. Then if you have any suggestions on speakers or vendors or any beekeeping products you would like to see there, definitely let us know. I haven't seen any comments yet. I don't think this chat bar is working with this laptop participants. No. All right. Hey, Laurel. Technical difficulties. Huh. I think I just deleted it. <laughs> I if you, if you all are giving me any questions and answers, I can't see anything right now. I don't know what I've done. Hmm. I'm going to wait till Laurel gets here because otherwise I'm just going to end up accidentally shutting this down. So let's talk about the weird flow this year. We are almost in July. We're usually extracting honey or have already started a week or two ago. We're shaking nectar today. Yesterday and today, nectar's coming out. I'm looking at plants that are flowering and it's almost July. They usually don't flower this late. We still have a little bit of sumac coming in that I saw today and bees were on it. We had sourwood blooming, which we don't have a lot of sourwood around here. The elevation's not quite right, but we do have some sourwood and it's blooming right now. So what I feel like's going on is we have multiple different things that have been backed up and are hitting some of the things that this time of the year do naturally come on, but it's kind of compounding upon one another and it's created quite a significant flow. Um, you see this Laurel? I have no bar over here. So I don't know what to do about it. Maybe just use it on my phone or something. You can pull that up for me. Also we have, so we have sumac, we have sourwood. What? Well, I mean, someone's got to. We also have white Dutch clover. We've been getting good rains, and we have sweet clover. And one or two odds and ends. Oh, yes, milkweed is blooming. And this is not normal to have all of these different plants going at one time. Laurel is working diligently to get the questions to where I can see them, and then I will start taking those. But, yes, this is I've never seen this before. We are concerned that some of the brood nests are going to get filled up because we don't add supers this late in the game typically. So apparently now I'm going to have to watch out for that. All right. So a lot of questions here. I have missed quite a bit. So we've got Natalie on from beekeeping like a girl. Is there a temp too hot to graft in or to start the queen rearing process. It's over a hundred here with low humidity and will be all summer long with two day old grafts work better in hot weather. I don't know about that. The main thing is when you're grafting them, I would try to keep them as, as cool as I could. So I wouldn't want them in direct sun. Also, as you're dropping them into the cup, like I showed in my last queen video, you're going to want to take a damp towel, especially where you're at. Definitely have that damp towel. And 
when you put them into a starter, finisher, whatever, make sure it's well vented. Whether that's a screened bottom board, whether that's an upper entrance. And it wouldn't be a bad idea to have like two lids on that hive because lids can get pretty hot, especially if it's just a migratory lid or a regular lid with metal on it. So if you have two lids or something on the top of it to kind of give it a little bit of shade, that, that's handy. Oh, we got Chris Summers on here too. But I, I think you can still raise queens that time of the year, but you definitely have to keep them cool. If, when you're catching queens or any process of, of the queens, we definitely don't want them getting over a, you know, 100 degrees. We definitely would prefer to keep them more around room temperature uh, when we actually catch the queens once we pull them in. But uh, I think you can still manage it. You're just going to have to be a little bit more careful. Definitely don't leave them out in the sun. Shadow Winds Apiary in Homestead. Hey, thanks for coming on. All right, roll tide. All right, all right, roll tide. I'm ready for football season. Can you invite Peter Cowan? Love his channel, Be Whisperer. I have never checked his channel out, but I'll have to give it a shot. We do have some pretty cool people coming, and there's going to be more coming, especially with good suggestions like this one. Um, Frederick Dunn is planning on coming. Mr. Ed just said he's planning on coming. So if you watch his channel, the Dirt Rooster is going to be there. Ian Stepler, Bob Benny, Rick Sutton, Greg Rogers. We are going to have multiple other people, and I'm working pretty hard on that right now, trying to get some really cool vendors and have every cool B product that we possibly can have, even some out of, out of country, if they will work with us. And I'm actually talking to Easy Loader. Yeah, the company that has that nice lifter that Ian uses, and they're talking about coming out as well. The cool thing is, I really think, because we have, one, wonderful people already signing up as vendors. Now, I say signing up, it's all preliminary, but they've committed. And they're already working on deals that you just can't, you cannot anywhere else that I'm aware of get this. So we're going to have deals, on everything from frames to foundation, pollen sub, and on pre-orders from several of these companies, 10% uh, discounts. If you buy a lot of B stuff like I do, you're probably going to be able to pay for the experience just on the savings. And you get to listen to Bob, Betty, and Ian, and and see Randy and Mr. Red probably burn the place down. So it's, it's going to be quite a bit of fun. All right. So I am scrolling through here, and... Speaker suggestions would be great to have Mel that speaks on on-the-spot queen rearing and might decide free beekeeping at your conference. Well, we've already got our speakers pretty much lined up, but it is good to hear these kind of things now because we are working currently on the 2023 speakers. I have a really aggressive hive and a downright, it's a downright mean colony. They are producing well, but I'm going to requeen next week when I have a queen ready. If that doesn't help, what can I do? Execute. Well, it should work as long as you have a queen that does not have aggressive behavior that you're introducing and she goes in and actually takes over. It's going to take a while, though. It's going to probably take, uh, you know, at least two brood cycles. Because think about it. I mean, if that other queen lays an egg. It's going to take 21 days for it to emerge. And then those bees are going to be around for multiple weeks. So it's going to you know, probably be basically two months before you see a noticeable difference um, or, or close to it. But yes, that, that should work. I mean, if, if that doesn't fix it for you, then it's up to you what you want to do. Maybe sell them. Some pe I know some beekeepers like, mean bees are the best bees. I'm like, well, fantastic. I'm going to sell you some of these mean, the, the few mean colonies in the yard. All yours, buddy. How do you deal with the lane worker hive? Well, there's a couple variables there. Typically, lane worker hives are pretty weak, but that's not always the case. If they're pretty strong, I have a lot of queen cells going right now. So I'll drop a queen cell in there and give them a frame of larvae or something like that. And if the queen goes out on a mating flight and comes back, usually that, that works pretty good. But if it doesn't work in that shot, then I just shake them out. Giving them a frame of larvae or eggs helps for multiple reasons. First of all, it 
it changes the dynamics in the colony. When they see that brood, it, it really discourages that laying worker tendency because that's really what suppresses them doing that is having brood in the colony. So if we have brood, we're, we're suppressing that laying worker healthy, the right type of brood. And also when that queen comes back, hopefully that new queen, then she has that brood and some pheromones working for her favor and, and also getting some young bees churned out to kind of help her establish a brood nest. But laying workers, if they're, if they're small and they're weak, I definitely don't want them destroying, well, not destroying, but resizing all those cells and getting them into big drone cell sized uh, combs. So typically we have so many colonies, honestly, we shake them out most of the time. Let the bees drift back as long as there's no high mite loads. And what you can do, because typically if they're laying worker, there's no brood, right? So hit them with oxalic acid vapor. You're going to eliminate a huge percentage of the mites. And then if you shake them out, if there is mites in that colony, you're not sharing them with the rest of your, your hives. But typically we just focus on taking care of our big counties, shake those out, make a split down the road or right then. Hello, Poland, B Lord. Good to see you on here. We got, man, we got a lot of people from Europe on here. Let's see. Questions, questions. Should I open my horizontal hive fully or add frames as it grows? It's best with any hive setup if you have the time to section it off. It's, and it really depends on the time of the year. It really does. But in the cooler parts of the season, especially, it is really advantageous to you know, partition part of those long hives or, or if it's just a regular Langstroth hive, don't give them too much space too quick. The better they are able to regulate the temperatures in the brood nest, the better they are going to do. So if you can partition that off, try to stay a little ways ahead of them though. Don't, don't keep it too close. If they're eight frames of bees, give them, you know, another 30, 50 percent you know you know what the brood looks like if they've got great brood patterns in there with a lot of bees on the way then probably need to give them 50 percent at least just keep an eye on it this time of the year bees can grow pretty quickly if they have a great queen hey christopher palmer we are doing very well we are busy 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 is the 22 high of life conference going to be held at the same place as 2021 Actually, I spent all day Monday of last week looking at a couple other options. And primarily because, as many of you experienced last year, we, we were at half capacity due to restrictions. But we really liked the setup. We had round tables. It spaced people out. And also, if we would have stuck full capacity in that room, it would have been sardines in there. And I just don't find that as fun. It's also would be a lot louder and possibly a lot hotter. So we're looking for a bigger room just so even if we, we want to, you know, if we can, ha we can have more people, number one, but also we can have more people and it won't be really crowded because I liked having those round tables. I think a lot of people did because it was kind of your space. You could have your family members there or your B club. There are several B clubs that loaded up a couple tables, which was really cool to see them all um, talking bees and everything like that. And then at the same time, you can put your gear that you bought at the table. If you had a snack or something like that, it's at your table instead of just having a chair and rows. So we're looking at something that's going to keep it comfortable and also make it, uh, you know, to where you can get more people. So there's a high, high probability that it won't be there. We've talked with that venue. They just can't get us a bigger room. So, um, we're looking at a couple options that all will be announced in the upcoming weeks. Try to have signups within four weeks from now. So we are pretty busy on that right now. Between that and getting that new extraction set up, whoo, we, we are we are crazy right now. Did my first cut out today with help from your dead tree video. Th thanks, the rubber bands worked great. What a mess though. Hey, Chris, uh, I'm glad it was helpful. That's like the only cut out video that I've ever done and probably might be the last unless I do one with Randy or somebody. I really am not a great cut out person. One, because I, I do not enjoy doing them at all. Um, we really enjoy just making our own splits, but the hive was, it was so rotten and they'd already cut the tree down because if someone would have been, Hey, there's a swarm or a hive in that tree. Do you want to cut the tree down and get out? or just let left them to their own devices. 
But since they'd already dropped it, and it was, I think it was in March, early March, it was a cold time of the year, and it was exposed to rain. Um, you know, we we saved the bees, and those that that hive has, I've got at least two hives off of that original by now. The original queen's gone, but her offspring are still kicking butt, making honey this year. Used my Hillco honey extractor today for the first time. Worked great. Well, I, I have one to test this year. Thanks for your feedback, Joseph. I'm really interested to see how they work. They sound really quiet. Is, is yours pretty quiet, Joseph? All right. With a mean hive, split down. If you were in California with a mean hive, split it down to one to two, three frames and keep her in a larger pushing cage and open and close. Okay, so someone's just giving a suggestion there. Hmm. This is our first year harvesting sizable amounts of honey. Can spun supers be out back on hives afterwards? How and when do you store supers? Different states, different rules. But when you spin them, some states, you can just set them out. Just make sure they're not in the sun, like as far as the sun directly hitting the wax, because you don't want the sun melting your combs. They will do it quick, too. So, you know, I preferably give them some shade. But the bees can feed them out in some states. In states like Tennessee, it, it's illegal to do that. They don't want the, the spreading of disease. That's their reason for that. But you also can put them on, back on the hive afterwards, which is what you're supposed to do in Tennessee. So how and when do you store supers? So when we're done, we've got to place them back on the colonies to be cleaned out. And you know we're in a dearth, so they're not going to fill them back up. And then we can remove them later. Big pain in the butt. And then we store them just as they are. About eight frames to a 10 frame box though, space them out, ventilation. Main thing, we don't want mice to get in there, but wax moss, as long as there's no bee bread in them or anything else, they, uh, they'll they store just fine. Have you had problems with the virgin queen and the honey supers when you switch them back into a single hive? Um, occasionally I'll have some issues. So when I was going through like the video I had this morning, one of those hives has two queens in a virgin was created at some point. You Sometimes we have hives that have two queens in them. And there was a queen laying below the excluder and a new queen laying above the excluder. And man, you want to talk about a massive colony. You also want to talk about a pain in the butt because she was laying three honey supers. And so that's never fun. However, the colony is going to make probably 120, 130 pounds of honey. So I'm not really complaining, but... Um, it is, it happens and virgins will slide through excluders a whole lot more. Sometimes even mated queens will slide through excluders, especially if they're bent or something. All right. Thanks for the good feedback, everybody. I really appreciate it. Hi, Cayman. Been a great honey season here in Kentucky. Glad to hear it's been exceptional for you all too. It has been a while. It's just been crazy. I've never seen a year like this. I mean, we're shaking nectar frames out and it's almost July. I've never seen that. It's crazy. But I've never seen sweet clover blooming at the same time of milkweed and sourwood. It's all blooming at the same time. And white dutch is doing well because of some of the frequent rains that we're getting. And we have a few other, you know, a little bit of sumac still blooming, which is surprising. I was looking at some today. So, yeah. Just, and beekeeping, expect the unexpected. I've... I've I, I'm sure I don't have two years that are exactly alike, but this year this has really thrown me for a loop, but I'm very thankful for the honey that we've made this year. Let's see here. Hey, Cayman, I just saw that you will be the guest speaker for my local club in Greene County, Ohio. Yes, that's going to be the 6th of July, and that's going to be a Zoom meeting, so that I'm looking forward to that. And we're actually going to talk about winter prep and I was just at a bee club in Tennessee. Um, there, it was a nice little uh, gathering. There's like 40 odd, 50 people, something like that. And it was great. And we talked about summer beekeeping and really how that translates into winter beekeeping as well. Hey, Yasmin, I hope that you're doing good over there in Sweden. I've been seeing some of your uh, little videos and your pictures on your grafting and splits. I also really like how you're wax dipping your equipment. It's not maybe the easiest way to do it, but Yasmin, for those of you who didn't know that you could do this, she's got herself a system where she can only do one side of the box at a time. She can do multiple boxes on one side. And so she cooks them for a little while and flips them over. 
and it takes a little bit longer, but she's making it work with the, the tools that she has. And, uh, I'm anxious to see how, um, how those boxes do for her, do for her. So that's, it's really a creative way to get wax dipping done and, and do it very cost effective. Do you have an opinion on a bee yard seed, seed mix from Man Lake? I, I've never purchased any seeds from Man Lake. Um, personally, I like to get it from my local co-ops because, one, I like to support them more, like 100 times more. <laughs> and uh, then on top of that, I think I get better pricing. So I'm, I'm confident I do, actually. So sweet clover is great. Crimson clover, we do that. My dad planted buckwheat, and it is looking really good, just starting to bloom at one of our bee yards. I'm going to have a little video on that, I'm sure. But, uh, you know, I don't know what all they have in their mixes. All right. Hey, Steve Chubb, thanks for coming on tonight, and thanks for your support yet again. We really appreciate you. Ask some questions if you have them. So let's see, here is a question. After you shake the bees back into a single hive, when do you start to check the queen's ex existence during the nectar flow? If the queen escapes or getting, if the queen escapes or, you know, swarming, I guess, or getting crushed during the shaking process. We're pretty good about not crushing queens, but I'm sure it has happened over the years at some point. Typically, after we've reduced them down, we come back about five or so days later and see how they're doing. Are they wanting to swarm? And a couple will want to. And so we have to cut cells and we, we do it. We get back to them before they cap the cells. And we make sure we go through every one of them and make sure that she has space. Obviously, the honey supers are on. And this is where it really, you got to have drawn combs above those single brood managements. Uh, there's no way in the world I would do single brood management the way that I, I do it now with just foundations. But when we reduce them down, you know, the ones that quickly accept their situation of this is where the brood nest is, they're good about clearing that honey above as long as they have space to do it. Once they commit to that, it's pretty good. And we do lose some swarms. In our yard yesterday, there was a couple colonies that had swarmed out. I have queen cells and I have mated queens. It's a numbers game at this point. There's no way Laurel and I can manage 400 colonies, just the two of us, and all the other stuff that we do, and really micromanage everything. So it's a numbers game. Out of 30 colonies, I'm going to lose a couple swarms. And we just try to make sure that we set them up to where they don't swarm early in the season. We cut them back. We make sure the first couple weeks that they're not wanting to swarm. And once they commit to that single brood management, they may swarm later and we do lose some swarms. But usually at that point, we at least got a decent honey crop. The ones that actually hold in there the whole season, those, those are ones that we potentially look as breeder material. How big of a honey crop do they produce? How easy was it to keep them into single brood management? What's their, are they pretty docile? Or is there any European fowl brood or chalk brood issues? And, you know, then we start figuring out what we want in our, our bees, and that works really good. But not all bees um, react to that situation the same. All right. Let's see. Get back. Do you have – no, I already did that one. How can I push my bees to draw more comb? I am a new beekeeper, and I've been fighting swarming. That is hard. If there's a strong flow going on and you don't have a lot of comb, it, it's tough. It, it's really tough, um, especially if they, if the queen's not laying really hard. It's, it's an interesting situation. you got to have that nutrition coming in and not just the nectar. You have to have the pollen because they need to want to lay brood. When the queen's laying really hard and is able to get into those cells, they can't put nectar there. And then if you end up with a surplus of nectar or sugar syrup, whichever is coming in, and you have pollen that's encouraging them to grow and lay, they've got to find places to put that. And if they don't have it, they will start drawing combs very rapidly. However, if you have a, a queen that's kind of eh, or if you have mites in there or something else that's kind of making the situation less than ideal, or if you just have a crazy strong honey flow, and that's this is a this has been a big year for swarming for a lot of Tennessee and Kentucky beekeepers and other people as well, because we've actually had a lot of nectar this year. Last year, we didn't have a lot of swarms, but we didn't have a lot of nectar. So it kind of comes with the territory. 
However, we are going to start drawing more combs. We're drawing combs now, but at the end of our honey flow, which is usually right now, we are going to yank everything off and then we're going to drop a box of foundation on top, pull a frame of larvae up and feed really thin sugar syrup. And we're going to get them to draw some more combs out. I'm hoping to get at least 1,500 more deeps drawn and a bunch, whatever mediums we have left that are not drawn, get them finished out as well. All right, back to the questions. Steve Chubb, I enjoy your videos and hard work with the experimental yard. I learn a lot just listening to your live chat. Well, Steve, I really appreciate you again supporting us very, very much, and I'm glad that it's helpful. How do I do cut comb? Okay, I don't know a whole lot about that. Um, obviously they have some thin foundations that you can use for that. Some people just use a starter strip and that's where shallow frames became very popular for a long time. And you don't see them used very much, but shallow frames are more ideal for cut comb. One of my buddies who's down in Memphis does a lot of comb honey. He's actually going to do some educational stuff here in the future. He already does a little bit, but he's going to do a little bit more. I might do some with him and he's, he's very experienced in plant foliage for bees and pollinators and also um, comb honey sells a good bit each year and is expanding that operation. I think it's fantastic. Comb honey is truly the prime way to eat honey. It's, it's all good, but if you're wanting the best, I, I personally think comb honey is the most prime way to eat honey. Cayman at the conference, you Bob and Kent talked about making nukes for replacement for winter loss. Can we start nukes at the end of July? I live in West Virginia. Ooh, I don't really know West Virginia that well. If you make them strong, I'll bet you can. I'm sure you can. However, if you could make them maybe slightly earlier than that, if possible, it'd be better. But yeah, I'm sure you could you could get away with it in July. Just don't make them little tiny things. Honestly, if you have a strong double deeps, why not just break the things right in half? Just uh, basically split the brood up, split the bees up. Have a queen in each one. If you have 10 hives, now you have 20. And that, that works really good, but maybe you're wanting to split a little more aggressively than that. But, um, yeah, I, I, I'm at, I don't really like doing too late a split, so I don't know what West Virginia is like that much. Here in northern Tennessee, I have made splits as late as the first and second week of September, and they, they don't give me a really high rate of success. I will have some of them over winter, but not what I'm used to with the rest of them. I, I usually think that uh, anything past early August for me, will it can work, but it's definitely not going to do near as well as anything I do prior to that. So we're fixing to do a lot of splitting here over the next 40 days, quite a bit of splitting. But we're going to be selling actually a lot of bees off. So if anyone's needing any singles, I'll be announcing that down the road, probably in the next three weeks when they're available, but they're going to be, our queens 2021 and single deep honey boxes or not honey boxes, but brood chambers, whatever. All right. Caught a feral swarm in Dandridge, Tennessee. Make some good honey over there. First time beekeeper at 61. Well, Hey, some of my favorite beekeepers are that age. So, and you're, you're, you're doing good catching swarms. They build out four and a half frames and eight frame deep box. When would you consider adding a deep or a medium box? All right. So you're in an eight frame box. Once they start about six frames drawn, um, especially since we're so warm now, go ahead and put on a second. I would add a brood box myself and pull up a frame of larvae and make sure that you position that larvae above the rest of the brood. Don't have the brood in the bottom box over here and then put the larvae frame up here in the next box. You want that heat to come up there and keep them warm. And that way that's going to encourage them to draw that. It would be right now. What you need to do is, is get comb and swarms are usually pretty good at doing it. So once they get about six frames drawn out, I would pull one of them up. And then when you come back later, maybe a few weeks, and they've drawn out several up top, you may decide that the ones that are down below that they maybe didn't draw all the rest of the way out, you pull them up to the top, drop some brood frames down below, and, and eventually over time you're going to get those all drawn. Once those are drawn, then maybe add a medium as well. You might have to feed at some point. First on, are the live chats recorded and available for later listening? 
Yes, they are. This one will should be available shortly after it is finished. Sometimes it takes YouTube a little bit of time. Hey, Jeff Upton. I hope things are good going good for you down there in Arkansas. Have you tried Ross Rounds? No, I have not tried Ross Rounds, Steve. But if I was going to do any type of comb honey production that was kind of um, a system, I wouldn't do Ross Rounds. I would do the hog half comb. That's just from people that I've talked to. This is not off of experience. This is just people that I talk to that have experience. And also, I think what I would prefer to use and sell, what makes sense to me, the hog half comb would be better. I think it's the basswood sections. I think they're still basswood, but it's wood sections and they're square, but you, they still have cassettes. So when you, you pull them out, they're gorgeous. And it's, it's kind of like instead of getting rounds, you get the squares. And I, I think it's, it's a better way of doing it. Just me personally. Let's see. What do you do with honey frames that are drawn out from sugar water feed and they have stored sugar water? Honey stored after them after they're drawn. I just leave them in the hive. If you need to get that out of there, then you can extract those. Obviously, it's not honey. But if it's honey thickness and it's been dehydrated all the way down, you can literally put that in a bucket and use that to dilute back down to one to one to feed later. Or you can make some really nice pollen patties with sugar syrup that's been made honey thickness. Have you ever used Ian's cone style escapes? I have not. Ian um, hasn't sent me any. I'm, I'm kind of hurt. But, you know, I will try one down the road, I, I'm, I'm sure. They look like they'd work pretty good. I imagine, you know, after trying them out on thousands of colonies, Ian would probably agree with that, that they work pretty good. <laughs> all right, going through the questions and all that stuff. All right, so let, I got a couple of things that I wanted to say as well, now that we got a lot more people on here. So we picked up, a lot of people have been asking about that new extraction system. I'm going to have a video on that, but some people are like, why did you get that? And... I asked myself that several times when I, I purchased it. It was a $19,000 investment into our operation, which is a good chunk of change. And I really was not planning on dropping that kind of money anytime soon on an extraction set. But honestly, it was a good price. That system is worth it. Cowan is made in America. I'm going to try to have them at our conference. They don't make stuff for small beekeepers. I mean... I'm looking at this equipment. I'm like, I'm not even going to fully utilize this to its potential. This stuff is just insanely awesome. It's the Cadillac of extraction equipment in my experience um, with watching Ian and Bob and their systems and what little life toyed with it so far. And I also, my silver queen is, is was made by them and my extraction video last year, that's a cow one, but I, I, purchased it because we're at the point where we're going to have to get interns or we're going to have to get an employee. And that's just, that's just the way things are. We just cannot keep up. The bees are doing good. We're very thankful for that. We're growing. But we're trying to find ways to save time and save our backs. And this machine is going to do just that. Talk, Ian, thankfully, talked to me about it. I asked him a couple questions about his system, what he thought about investment and stuff like that. And at this stage in our business, we couldn't afford to do this in the past. And we weren't in the, the position. We were doing everything the hard way until we kind of got to the point where the bees could justify some of these expenses. And now it's going to save us so much time. What we can extract now compared to five years ago, we, we can do in one day now what would have taken us two weeks, four or five years ago. And it would have been really hard Hand, we were hand uncapping. We were doing everything slow in the old fashioned way. But once we started really getting things going well with the bees, things have just kept multiplying. And I think that's something that you all are going to experience if you stick with it. When you really go with the great queens, dead mites, and good nutrition as, as your base, and then you figure out some things like swarm and you get some combs and you get all these things to click we have too many bees we're gonna that's why one of the reasons we're selling these singles is to pay for this extraction equipment but also we have that many bees to sell it's a wonderful feeling 
I've dreamt of a year like this for a long time. And uh, I hope many of you have this in your future as well. And I know many of you want to. And that's part of the reason why we do these conferences and videos. But I made that investment because I feel like it's a lifetime investment. I don't plan on getting out of beekeeping. And then on top of that, it's going to save me a lot of time. And Laurel said I could. So, I mean, guys, you know, when your wife says you can buy bee stuff, you have to just say, I mean, you got to get it. I mean, <laughs> okay, I better stop. So let's get back to the questions. How many pounds of honey do you expect per hive? Well, I don't really expect anything per a, after last year, but what I hope to see, and I believe with a great queen in a average year and proper management on my and Laurel's part, we can get a hundred pounds of honey off of that colony on a good year. We can, we can push upwards to 140. My record is like 142. But when you average it over the yard, because there are some colonies that swarm, there are some colonies that have some queens that, you know, supersede, you know, at the worst time of the year that they could, but you know, they just do run out of gas at the wrong time. And so when you average it out, I like to see 100 pound averages throughout the yard. And for Tennessee, we will take it. Let me tell you. And some of my yards, I'm going to do over that this year. But I think overall, uh, for our honey production colonies, we're, we're probably going to see about a hundred pound average this year. Very tickled, very, very thankful and, and tickled. It's nice to, when you work that hard and your bees are really strong that they're actually able to, to make it happen. Cause it's, it's crazy. The honey flows almost over and it's just started and this is it for the whole year. And then we're done. I'm not like my entitled buddy in Hawaii that gets like a flow every couple weeks, <laughs> but honey is a plague over there. Almost Brian, Thank you so much for the $20 donation to our experimental yard and our endeavors. Ah, Ian's on here. Cowan, 100%. Well, watching your videos, Ian, um, really helped. And I, I tell you, that's what the YouTube videos are for. It's one of the reasons why we review products sometimes that we don't even use because there's other products out there that uh, maybe will work good on, you know, for someone with 50 hives or 20 hives. But I didn't expect to get a Cowan even within the next four or five years. Just didn't plan to make that jump. I was going to just grow slowly, but the price was good as good use price. It's in good shape. Talk to Ian about it a little bit, and you can obviously watch his videos and see what it does and how efficient that is. And uh, I'm going to love every second of using that equipment. Let's see. Went from three hives to 22 this year. Whoo! Running out of equipment, I'll bet. Awesome, Wade Barnes. Let's see. I, I want to make sure I didn't miss anything up here. Uh, I'm sure I did. I apologize. It's hard to keep up with everything. Mm -mm -mm. Yeah, I hope you get some rainy, and I know that they're short on rain up there. Oh, the flow has hit hard. Okay, well, good. I hope that you get some rain for it. Uh, I'm short on drawn comb. How early would you add foundation to a hive so that, so that they have time to draw it out so they don't swarm how many frames filled out in a brood box so you're short on drawn comb i don't know your location but if you're like me we're in a hot time of the year adding space too early in cool parts of the year when you're dropping back in the 40s or you know stuff like that that's when you can set the bees back but this time of the year goodness we're thankful if we can drop back at night in the fifties. And so I'm not too concerned with it. Get it on a little early, especially if the bees are drawing down below, go ahead and throw it on. The way I look at it is if they don't draw everything in the bottom box because you added the top box, but they start drawing up there. You can always come back later and, Take some of the foundations out of the bottom and switch them with some of them up top. It's a little bit of work, but that's what it takes. Once the best way I find to draw combs, once you get things established, excuse me, <clears throat> is to draw them in your honey supers. Now, if you do all one size, that's really advantageous. But if you have multiple sizes, that's where, you know, okay, yeah, you're drawing foundations out, but they're not your deeps for your brood chamber, they're mediums. This is one of the reasons why it is really nice to have all one size. 
but also when the honey flow is done, yank those honey supers off fast. Don't dilly dally around, get them off. Those bees are still strong in population and it's older bees that draw out foundation. It's not the nurse bees. So you still have that older population and you're still coming off of that flow. So the queen's still laying, pull those honey supers, put on some foundations, pull up some larvae, and give them some really thin syrup. It doesn't even have to be one to one. Three quarters of a pound of sugar to one pound of water. Real thin. Give them a little bit. And I did a lot of that last year. Drew a lot of deeps that way. This year, on every honey production colony, I'm going to try to draw a deep box. So, goodness. I, I, I mean, I, I'm, I, I'm stuttering all over myself is what I'm doing. I'll, I'm going to draw a lot of foundations. I do have some combs, though, that didn't get used this year. So I am probably going to throw a couple of those on and just freshen them up a bit. Hey, Brian Reese, thank you so much. And by the way, I appreciate your donation for it. Um, and there's other people as well that donated towards Laurel getting a gimbal. She has it now. And for those of you who don't know, and that should be a part of our videos to come, which will make much smoother turns and transitions. Not that Laurel didn't do a great job before, but it also was pretty hard on her, um, especially because I get long-winded. And, and some of these videos takes multiple takes, um, especially on a bad day. If I've been like, if it's been really hot and I've been sweating, electrolytes are low. I mean, I'll take 15 takes on a video. And poor girls, her forearms are probably like steel or something by now, I'd say. But this is going to help her out quite a bit. But thanks, Brian, for being one of our biggest well being our biggest um individual donator to our youtube channel and i hope you're doing good out there in jersey all righty and uh jason thank you so much as well i've never seen that little icon with the sunglasses over there before must be a new thing but thanks so much i can't remember if you're, if you're the new yorker there's so many people to keep track of but thank you all right Quit feeling guilty about your cow and you've earned it. Well, Laurel, Laurel and I, uh, I don't know if we quite agree with that, but um, I appreciate you saying so for sure. I, I don't, I'm just thankful for whatever we can get. Um, and I'm also thankful that it's going to make life easier for Laurel and myself. So that frees up time for, with the kids and um, other things. If anybody's thinking about doing it, don't just you know, pick up some lever next day or two. Okay, okay. I don't know what that was, but. Uh, da, 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 da. so too much of that. So one of the things that I've also mentioned, I want to get back to the questions in here in just a second. So with the conference, for those of you who come back late, if you're wanting to come, that's going to be coming out in the next like four weeks, sign ups. It's going to go fast, going to go quick. As long as nothing crazy changes, we're planning on having full capacity regular capacity. So we'll be able to get more people in, but we were having to turn some people away last year. And I imagine it's going to just be more because I have people asking every day. So make sure when that becomes available, it'll be announced here on YouTube and also on Facebook that you are ready for that. And I want to know who or what product you want to see there. We want to have them there. We're already working very hard to get the best deals. This is going to be really the best place to buy equipment. So plan, if you're coming, plan on just bringing a, something to haul some stuff away. Because if you're going to buy it anyways, you might as well get a, a discount on it. It's going to be a, it's going to be good. It's going to be really good. I, I, and uh, last people, last people, last year, people, some of them paid for their conference just in the savings. So you got to listen to Bob Benny last year, Kent Williams and Ian virtually this year. Hopefully it won't be virtually unless the Canadians uh, keep freaking out up there. Uh, <clears throat> as I say that, I'm sorry, Ian and uh, any other Canadians. And, uh, you know, any, anyways, huh? if you want to see something there or somebody there, and it doesn't necessarily have to be a speaker. It could be a person of interest. Frederick Dunn. We've got him. The dirt rooster is going to be there. He's going to bring Mr. Ed. I've got a couple other YouTubers I'm talking to right now. And uh, if you can think of anybody like that, um, we will try to also keep in mind we're looking for people for 2023. So let us know now so we can work on it. 
we're going to have a lot of pre-orders on wax dip boxes, great foundation prices, the, maybe the best, especially this is where it comes in handy. I can get bulk pricing because I buy a lot of stuff, but most of you can't. And I remember what it was like back when I could not. And once I got to that point where I could buy in bulk is like, oh my goodness, this is fantastic. We're planning on having that kind of stuff available as much as we possibly can. So that is good news. All right, back to the questions. Oh, let me show you something real quick. This is what we have been working on all the last week. I got a bunch of queens in our incubator here in this room and uh, got a nice bunch of them right here. Look really good. There's nothing like raising your own queens and, you know, queens and bees in general, they're just, they're very sensitive. They're sensitive to temperatures, stress, just like anything else, but they have short lives. And so even a good degree of stress, I mean, can really affect a, a significant portion of their life. That is why I think raising our own queens and essentially dropping in, them into hives and just there's no putting them in queen cages and moving them. They're just there to stay. It's the best way to do it. If you can raise your own or get a buddy of yours to do it or buy queen cells, it's just fantastic. I don't think these are, these are emerging out in the next day and a half. Oh yeah. I don't know if you'll be able to see this or not. Yeah. I think you can kind of see that, but you can see that queen right there. She's white, but she's, Pretty well developed. So we've, we'll be dropping these things first thing in the morning. All right. I better put those back in the incubator because uh, we definitely don't want to stress them. It's kind of a little hypocritical, isn't it? Sorry, girls. All right. I'm back. Let's get to the questions. Hey, Laurel. All right, so tell us about your cow. And so I'm going to have a video on it, but if you've watched Bob's extraction videos or Ian's, it is similar to that. I don't quite have all the bells and whistles that they do, but Cowan is made in the USA. And I mean, it's made like things were made back in the day. This stuff is so solid. It's also made, it's almost complicated. It's so simple. They make things that can be worked on and can be fixed and that don't become obsolete. There are beekeepers who are liter literally finding some of their machines from the early 80s and late 70s and sending them to them, and they just have to mess around with it a little bit. They'll update it make it a little bit nicer, and bam, it's a workable machine again. Or if it's not really needing much updates at all, then they'll just you can get the parts from them and literally have it working. It's a, a wonderful system. And Cowan just, you can just tell that they are really good at what they're doing. I wish so bad. I know they don't probably want to get into this market, but if they could produce something for the sideliner beekeeper, the smaller beekeeper, I would love to, to help them out with my YouTube channel just because their products are exactly what every person wants to use. So well made, so tough. Lifetime investment. Brian Reese. All right. 12 deeps and 12 dipped mediums. All right. All right. All right. I got it. Let's see here. New to grafting, grafted 10 queens, seven accepted and successfully mated. All are laying well, but the queens are very small. Any thoughts? And is that a big deal? Well, if they don't have a lot of room to lay, let's say they're in a, you know, maybe a two frame colony. Sometimes uh, they don't, they just, they have to slow back laying production so much they don't swell up quite as much. That could be a small part of it, but also some of it good could be um, part of the process. Did you graft young enough larvae? Were, if the, were they a little bit too old? I don't know, but the most important thing, I've seen some smaller queens that laid wonderful patterns. I've seen some giant behemoth queens that weren't worth a nickel. They were They cost me money keeping them in the hives. So... Ultimately, what are those brood patterns looking like and, and how are they doing for you? 
But congratulations on raising some queens. That is awesome. And it's just going to get better for you. All right. Uh, did I miss anything? Let's see. Let's see. Wow. A lot of questions. Sorry if I missed yours. Um, feel free to keep going. Hey, John Hatch. Hope things are going good for you up there in the northern part of the country. You guys have had some crazy weather. I would love to come just to meet you guys that I watch on YouTube and be a fly on the wall. Just need to see if I can get time off. So, yes, that's going to be January 7th and 8th. January 7th and 8th. And um, hopefully um, you can. Two-day queen cells. Have you tried them yet, Cayman? Uh, I've, I've kept trying. I literally had everything set and prepared to do it. And the, the week that I was having everything set up to do it, that extraction equipment became available. I had to drop all of my plans to do that. This was not the time of the year that I needed to change my extraction system. Let me tell you. Let me tell you. And then on top of that, I uh, the guy that works with me on this conference and helps me out was like, hey, man, I've got appointments the same week to go out to these venues over Tennessee, and we spent all day doing that. So it was just back to back. I haven't, I haven't even been able to sleep a normal schedule in the last 10 days, but I'm going to do it. I promise you. I was just thinking about that today, but no, I have not tried it yet. Natalie has, but I am going to do that. I've got, well, I've got these queen cells here. And so my plan is if I graft tomorrow, I'll have two day queen cells in just a couple of days while I'm making up splits for these, which I've already made some, I'm just going to make a few more for the two day queen cells, shoot a video we're going to do a side-by-side, -side, try to do 10 versus 10 and see what the percentages are. And if they're pretty comparable, then cool. And we're also going to see queen size and a couple odds and ends. And we'll talk pros and cons because there's advantages and disadvantages to either system. Let's see here. Question. Do I limit the number of colonies to my property or consider surrounding open areas? So, I would move, I would have no more than 40 production colonies. Um, every now and then I'll go past that, but it's not by design. It's just by lack of bee hearts. And sometimes I get too many hives. But more and more, especially if you're not trying to really push things hard, it's better to have fewer colonies per yard. It's, it's easier on the bees, but there's got to be a balance between what's efficient and also what's not too limiting on what's available for the bees. I like 30 as a minimum, and I, I like 40 as a maximum for a honey production yard. Then if you are going past that, and of course there's, there's variables. I mean, you might be in an area that could do twice that much. I mean, my buddy in Hawaii, his honey production yards are way bigger, but you know, goodness, it's Hawaii for Pete's sake. And uh, in some areas, maybe 20 is as many as you'd want to do in one location. Like up here at my house, I took all the honey production colonies almost completely out of here. I think that's part of the reason why the colonies that did get left behind that were medium-sized did so good because there wasn't many of them, and they didn't have any competition from any bigger colonies. And it was a good year to boot. That always helps. But the colonies that I took down to different bee yards and 30 to 40 yard did much better. So spread them out. Get them about two, maybe three miles apart, your bee yards. Find a farmer. Give them a case of pints every year. That's usually what I do. And man, they are, they just think I'm the, I'm doing them such a big favor and uh, good bee yards from people that appreciate it. And actually it's a good location um, are, are very valuable. How much bee bread per frame of bees slash brood should they have? I don't really know what the exact ratio for that should be. For a double deep, though, I definitely would want to see um, a minimum of two, the equivalent of a collective amount of two full frames of bee bread. That doesn't mean it's all going to be in two frames. It'll be spread out, but um, it'd be nice to see more than that, too, especially if you have a dearth. But if you start getting too many frames of bee bread, you might want to yank some out, give them some space. Dennis asks, do you clip your queen's wings? I've never done that before, and I, I don't think uh, I am for... Am, am ever going to start. How do you deal with the hot hive of aggressive bees when you can't find the queen? Ah, that is tricky. Well, so let's say you're in a double deep or triple deep or whatever. Put some excluders in there 
and take half of the brood and stick it above the excluder, half the brood and stick it below. You've separated it out. And then when you come back five or six, seven days later, all the eggs and young stuff should be down in the bottom box or the second deep box or whatever. And now you at least know which area she's in. Maybe you can find her then, but even if you don't want to find her, then the box that doesn't have the queen, but still has brood because you sh split it in half, you can make a split with that and put a queen in there and a more docile queen. And that doesn't get rid of your other queen though. But you know, that's where you find some of those beekeepers that like to get stung a lot and say that they do. And you just sell it to them for a premium because you know, they, they should pay that much for a, a nice hive. Um, but uh, you know, I, I don't know if you can't find the queen that it kind of leaves you in a tough spot. You could drop a queen cell in there. And sometimes if you drop a queen cell in there with a cell protector, like the ones I just had, the virgin will hatch out and she will go and find that mated queen and hunt her down and eliminate her, which is pretty normal for a virgin to do. Does not always work, but sometimes it does. David Smith, thank you for your donation. Um, I really, again, don't know the ratio of that. Um, I meant to say thank you for the donation a second ago. I just kind of got caught up into things. But my buddy in Hawaii, they have bee bread problems over there. So it really depends on where you're at. Bee bread is really important during our summer dearth. This year probably isn't going to be that bad of a dearth period because we're still bringing a little bit of pollen in and have nectar. Very odd year for sure. And uh, hopefully we'll get enough rain. The fall flow will be good. So this will be a very easy and gentle year on the bees and this is the type of year where it's easy for bees in the wild or in our boxes to just thrive and reproduce well last year was not so you know just uh as beekeepers we just kind of got to take it as it comes steve chubb wow thanks man i really appreciate that you got you got to see if you can get off of work though and save some of this money for the conference man i promise you that's the cool thing about this conference i think everyone can save the money on the equipment but also the the information that you're going to be able to get and it was cool to see people last year just be able to personally talk to bob benny because he's a really nice guy we try to find speakers that are great beekeepers good speakers for sure and also really personable so when they're off the stage they don't care if you have two hives, they're more than happy to talk to you. And uh, so I think it's it's worth uh, everything that, uh, that, that you have to do to get there. The farmers that let you put your apiary on their land. Oh, yeah. Farmers are great. Um, maybe not all farmers. If you don't want to put bees on someone's land that's growing a, a crop that gets sprayed with pesticide. Yeah. If there's a little bit of herbicide, you'd probably be okay. But, uh, you know, you just have to, around here, we don't have a lot of agriculture. But, yeah, farmers are great. The reason I say farmers is for multiple reasons. First of all, they're used to getting hurt. They are. I mean, farmers, they smash their fingers all the time. They get splinters. Equipment messes up. Things, you know, it's hot and sweaty. They're, they're around tougher conditions typically, okay? And so if I put my bees on their place and on the off chance they get stung, they, which has happened at one yard, and the usually, usually he calls me like, hey, Cayman, your bee, you got a hive or two over there that's getting a little ill. You, you need to tell them bees to settle on down. And that's the worst I get out of it. You can't beat that kind of treatment. Not, I'm not all farmers are like that. I mean, these are like old school type farmers. They're great. <laughs> And they love honey, and they appreciate it, too. Nevada, all right, all right. Fogger for mite treatment. Yeah, I don't, I don't know about that. I think, uh, I think you'd be better skipping uh, the fogger as well. Um, the oxalic acid vaporizers have limitations, and the foggers, I don't even think, work near as good. Why don't people use marshmallows to slow release queens? I think it was a thing before. Well, because there's too many variables. One, there's different brands of marshmallows. So some of them, they might chew through too fast. I'm not one of those guys that wants that queen out of the cage right away. I don't poke holes in my queen candy. I don't do any of that stuff. I put her down in there and it's with queen candy 
and I use two pounds of powdered sugar to one pound of my own personal honey. Now, when I sell them, I don't use my own personal honey because that's a good way to spread possibly disease or something. So then we use pro sweet or sugar syrup, um, some thick syrup that's honey thickness, but does not have any potential of um, honey borne pathogens. But two, two pounds of powdered sugar, Domino brand works really good. And then you can use one cup of warmed honey or warmed syrup. Mix is so much better. Drop it in a KitchenAid mixer. Works great. And it, you know, if it takes them a little bit longer, no big deal. We don't want to be in any rush. We don't want them getting to the queens too fast before they accept her. Um, but the whole, so the whole marshmallow thing is, I'm not saying that it can't work, but you have to be careful. I have to be careful. Matt, thank you so much for your $20 donation. If you have any questions, hit me with it. And we really appreciate you coming on to our live chat tonight. All right, Steve. Well, we hope to see you there. All right. Nashville Bees. For those of us who join, join late, when and where is the conference? So it's January 7th and 8th. That is a lock. However, right now it's at Lebanon, Tennessee, where we had it last year. But due to what we feel like is a monstrous demand for the seating, last year we had half capacity and we turned people away. But this year I feel like more people are going to be wanting to come. And the, the room that we had is just not that large. So we are looking at other options. We've looked at a few different facilities, and we're going to see what happens. But even with those, um, it's going to be interesting. We're going to have a ton of vendors. Like I said, it's going to be great. It's going to be it's going to be a lot of fun. I, I can't wait because there's some vendors that are going to be there that I've never got to meet before, and I'm anxious to see their product in person. That's the coolest thing for me on this YouTube channel is I've got to experience a lot of beekeeping stuff that I've wanted to for years, but it's either too far away or it's one of those things where it's expensive or maybe that's expensive, but you don't want to drop all those dollars just to be disappointed. Which can happen a good bit. You've got the same calendar, huh? It's a pretty good one. I ha I, I used to not ever keep anything like that. These days, I, if I don't have a calendar on my phone and on the wall, I'm, I'm I don't if I lost both of those, I'd be in trouble. And Laurel Laurel keeps up with the rest of it. Thanks for the tip on using funny honey for patties. Do you ever do you ever had to put patties on during a dearth? Oh yes. We are going to put patties on this summer, smooth out any nutritional gaps. A lot of people in Tennessee say don't ever do it. I do a lot of things people say don't ever do. <laughs> it's working good for me. Um, but you have to be careful. You know, if it's a double deep colony and there's a pollen dearth going on or there's just a trickle of pollen, not enough, and it's not nutritious enough, they're ravenous for that. They'll, they'll wear through that. But instead of putting it all on, just throwing it on, Split it in half. Just rip it right in half and put them right in the center of the brood nest between the two boxes. Don't put them on top. Um, sometimes I'll do that, but not not hardly. I just like to go ahead and throw them in the center um, just because they'll, they eat them so much faster. Eat them better from the top, eat them from the bottom, and then poke holes right where in between the frames. And you know, you'll get a tiny bit of small high beetle larvae every now and then in them, but ah. If your bees are so weak that that takes them out, then you might as well not have them anyways. All right, Nashville bees. I think that you'll really like it. I look forward to seeing you. Info on the lodging. So we are working at that, um, working on that. We're going to have multiple places like we did last year, and we did have group rates. So last year's prices were really nice. This year, depending on where we go, um, will vary. We were thinking about doing it in Nashville, and then we looked at how much it cost to even stay a night at a hotel in Nashville, and we said, uh-uh. And who wants to fool with that Nashville traffic, right? Um, but seriously, we're actually looking at multiple places. One of them is over towards uh, Sevierville slash Gatlinburg area and a couple other places. And some of the hotels over there are very reasonable, but some of the nicer ones, like one of them I was looking at, has an indoor water park which 
I know all of you beekeepers are really into those water parks in January. <laughs> uh, but seriously, yeah, those some of the, some of them are very expensive over that way. But we're going to make sure that we we do the best we can to keep this very cost effective. The goal is to. I'd love to see people break even on this, where they save so much money that they uh, they they pay for their trip and and the savings on stuff they would have just got anyways. Do you use formic acid in your hive management? I don't, Steve Chubb, but we are using it in the experimental yard, so I hope to learn a lot from that this year and see if it should be. I do know some beekeepers that use it here in Tennessee who are very successful. One of them was on Bob Benny's channel, Dick Brickner, who's a good friend of mine and a, a good beekeeper, and he uses formic acid. Excuse me late in the year once the bees start getting close to broodlessness to clean them out the rest of the way. And of course the temperatures are very low at that point, but I've, I don't use formic acid on a regular basis, but we're going to try that out and see how well it works. I hope we get some cooler days this summer so it'll, we can use it in its proper setting. What brand type of veil do you use? So I have an ultra breeze beast jacket. And, um, that, that works pretty good. I, the jackets made really well in the U S you pay a little bit more, but it's, it's durable. But as far as like just the regular veil that you see me in a lot of the videos, that is a veil I get from Kelly's and it's, um, which is man Lake. And it's the, it's their clear view veil. Their website sometimes can be hard to locate it, but a lot of times I will call Kelly's and I will talk to Jacinda. I call Kelly's cause they're a whole lot easier to deal with than man Lake. Even though it's the same products, uh, Kelly's people are just, uh, they're better. I don't know why, but they're cool. So I call Jacinda up whenever I need anything, and she's pretty cool. At this point, she's just kind of accepted her fate as having to fool with me all the time. Could be worse. Maybe. I don't know. Let's see. Let's see. Well, one of the reasons we thought about over towards Gatlinburg is because Okay, guys and gals, so you have spouses, right? And sometimes it's hard to get them to, you know, do these, you know, let you do these things. But now you can say, hey, honey, you know, whether it's your husband or your wife, honey, man, we, we, we can we can go to this B conference, but it's not just about that. This is really about you. You need some time away. Gatlinburg's right down the road. They got all this stuff. And, you know, then you just happen to get to go to your B stuff. So I'm, I'm working, I'm trying to help sell this to your spouse. It's, it's great strategy. Unfortunately, women read through this exceptionally well. So you better start practicing now, fellas. Good luck. Um, yeah, because Laurel sees through everything. Okay. Cayman, can you answer my question lost in the mix? Hey, Jason, um, I will see if I can find that. Um, if not, repost that. Okay. Hey, Brian. So what about the room they had the car show in? We'll see that that whole facility, the only week they have available for the big room is Easter Easter weekend. And, you know, we're not doing Easter weekend. Plus, we have to consider, you know, Ian and Bob and a lot of our speakers are, they only have a short window of time they're willing to speak because of their operations. And so, unfortunately, I, I really enjoyed having it there. I thought the location was good but they just can't get us a bigger room than that. And we could use that room, but take out all the tables. So now nobody has any table space. It's lined up chairs. We're packed in like sardines. And then where do we eat at? Then we have to haul all the chairs out and set them up for lunch every day. It, it's just going to be a pain in the rear. So I don't know. Maybe we'll just, we might have to keep the conference small this year again, which will be fine, but just fewer people will be able to come. Jason, I'm still looking for it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You might just have to repost it. Maybe I missed it. There's multiple Jasons on here. That was like the, what, the baby name of uh, for quite a while. It's very popular. I haven't seen a whole lot of Caymans around. Let's see here. Well, I'll see. I'm, I'm going to keep looking. Oh, no, that's not it. That's the other your other one. So like WR Farm said that he cuts his pollen patties when he feeds into three eight-inch strips. 
So you know, that helps spread it around a good bit. If you have large hives, a lot of bees going into a dearth and don't have space to split, well, they need space on top. I run double brood boxes, recommendations if I don't have space for splits. Well, um, typically if it's a dearth, the swarming tendency goes way down because as the pollen d either diminishes in quantity or quality, the queen has less inclination to brood up. So the population starts to go down. And as that happens, also there's no nectar or high levels of pollen coming in and plugging up the brood nest. So there's multiple reasons why the swarming tendency goes down. What you'll end up with is still big bearding colonies, but as you know, the queen shrinks back to laying, you know, 800 eggs a day instead of 1500 eggs a day, then every day you're going to, you know, the population starting to drop, but it's okay. As long as the bees are healthy, and the mites aren't a factor, a natural summer decline is normal in the South. We just want to make sure that they're strong enough that when the fall flow hits, that they have a good population size so they can capitalize on those pollens and nectars so they can go into winter, which is as much of that real stuff as possible. All right. Let's see here. One second. Hey, Laurel. She must have her earphones on. Well, Jason, I, I can't seem to find that comment. If you'll post it again, could you give me some water? I am. Oh, yeah, that'd be good, too. Uh, Laurel made me a, uh, well, not me. She actually made it for my cousin, but I just, I, I get to uh, benefit from her request. Some of our honey caramels. And oh, my goodness. It's like beekeeping. Uh, it's like a, a beekeeper's drug. It, it's it's terribly addictive. I got to say a big thank you real quick to Charles O'Neill. Thank you so much, Charles, again, for donating to our live chat and our experimental yard. If possible, um, please, uh, if you have a, a question, leave it below and I'll try to get to it. All right. Speaking of getting to someone's questions that donated... Jason, I'm new. I live in Southwest Florida. Okay, so you're you're way down in the in the muggy state of Florida. I have three hives, deeps filled up. I don't have more deeps. Added mediums to avoid swarming those filled up. Wow. Okay, so sounds like you need more equipment. But this is a rough time to buy boxes and stuff like that. I don't know what your flows are like there in your particular area of Southwest Florida. But if there's more honey coming in or anything like that, then you got a clear room. One of the ways that you can tell is go down into where around where the queen is laying. Is there nectar in between the eggs that she's laying? Are they putting a lot of nectar in that brood nest? And you may need to add another super if possible. And if they'll draw that out, that's fantastic. Or harvest the honey real quick and then put the, those empty combs right back on and clear that space. Ooh, that is a big piece. I'm fixing to be buzzing here in a second. What? I know that was spring water, Tennessee spring water. This is what I'm going to be buzzing from. Uh, I'm not going to pull an Ian on you or anything like that. I hope Ian's watching this. But yeah, this is honey caramel right here. Sweetened with delicious honey. Mm, so good. Only sugar in it. Right, of course. Why would you take honey and mix it with sugar? Okay, now that I'm going to sound like a buffoon. Thanks, Blanchard Bees, again for smashing that like button. All right. Okay, Jason Ruggio, three deeps arrived in the mail. Can I add a deep as the honey super? I'm not concerned with honey. I'd rather build the colonies. Absolutely. Absolutely. Just um, eat, throw them. Um, if, if you're running, no excluders. And so all your broods in, already in the second deep or whatever, um, get a frame of larvae up into those foundations. It makes them much more prone to start drawing foundation up there because they just, they, they want to build around that brood. Because larvae, bring that larvae up because larvae need resources. If you bring up capped brood, you can use eggs too because there'll be larvae shortly. But if you have capped brood, they don't need anything. 
larvae have to be fed so much and they it requires a lot of bee bread and pollen and also those nurse bees need a lot of energy to either cool things down or warm things up around the brood so there needs to be resources around that larvae so when it's foundations next to it they're really good about drawing foundation next to a larvae frame so yeah that's what i would do is throw that on top jason and uh, that that fix you up minimum small hive beetles that's always good so after the caramel do you have uh, two more hours for the live chat. I probably could do it. Laurel said that I cannot. So there's your answer, Todd. She's uh, <laughs> she's put restrictions, time limits on me. All right. Um, I also got to say thanks so much to uh, J.A. Duncan, 83. Thanks for all your info. Can we fix your flag in this setting? It should be flipped around and hung vertically. Again, thank you. Ah, well... I, I wonder if, uh, I, I guess it looks right to me, so I must have uh, not had it right, but maybe we can do something about that eventually. Um, but I really appreciate the donation. I will look into the flag situation and, uh, and we'll consult with people that know best, especially the mirror aspect of the video stuff always throws me. Pigeon Forge would be much better than Gatlinburg. Cheaper prices, less traffic, more for the spouse and kids too. We will definitely consider that, Jamie. And uh, we're looking at other places other than that as well. That's just one option, just a little tidbit. Um, just just because I thought that, you know, maybe there'd be more stuff if people wanted to bring their kids. Uh, I, I don't know. Just just a thought. Hi, Cayman. How do we know when and determine when the flow starts? How do we know when a flow ends? In town here in Middle Tennessee, we have more flowering in the yards than people do in rural areas. And you're right. Sometimes, especially in places that are irrigated and have a lot more ornamental type plants that are from other countries, some of those produce stuff for bees. And especially if you just have a couple hives, that can make a lot more impact than it could for someone like me who's got 40 to a yard or something. But the, the best way to tell is the bees' behavior. If they're bearding a lot, and there's not a lot of foraging going back and forth. And they can forage, per, you know, go back and forth pretty quick going for water. But go into the hive occasionally and look down in there. Is there fresh nectar down in there? Are they bringing in lots of pollen at the entrance? So it's more of an observation thing. I can, I can literally tell though when the, bra the bees when the bees are bringing in honey. They don't fly the same way when they're doing other things. You they they kind of gear down. I kind of in my mind think of it as like when I was truck driving. You have an engine brake. The slow, you know, slow the engine down just a little bit. So when the bees are coming in with a load of nectar, they're, they're, especially the sun's coming through at the right angle, you can see through the bees almost translucent. And they just come in, you, they start gearing down. You can, they're coming, they're going out fast and they're coming in slow, slower than normal. It's still pretty quick, but there's a difference. So I can, I can almost kind of tell. And, and like right now, we're taking a frame of brood and going like that to shake bees for, splits and stuff and there's just nectar falling out of it like crazy and if nectar is falling out like that that means it's happened like in the last day now if it's hard to shake out that could it could be over a day but if it's just like water that's like happened that morning probably but just kind of observe and uh that's that's really the best advice i can give you for that um i don't think i said thank you to ww outdoors thanks again for coming on and uh helping support everything that we do if you have any questions especially you guys who donated um just make sure you know i really appreciate you guys and would like to be able to get to your questions if you have any let's see third time is a charm how and when do you introduce foundation frames so multiple different times when we put our honey supers on and Ian does this, I was encouraged from Ian's videos and my um, honey producing buddy down there in Memphis, Gus, to put some foundations in your honey supers, get a couple in there. That's always great to, you know, you might have seven drawn combs and two or maybe whatever the arrangement is, get a couple per box drawn each year. So you're adding more drawn combs. I mean, you just you can't have too many drawn combs, I don't think. 
you can, but it's hard. Very few people do. And so that's one way to do it. And it works really good. You can also make shook swarms at certain times of the year, just shake bees out, buy a queen. It's basically like making a package, except it's much better because it's yours and it's right there and it's fresh and, and just feed them really good. And they'll draw comes out swarms. Whenever we get a swarm in, it always goes on foundation. By the way, that swarm video where I was on top of the Subaru, or maybe did I do two videos of that this year? Whichever one that was. The one I was standing on the box on top of the Subaru and whining about Ian not being there to help me get it. Um, yes, that one. That is working on its third deep box. Swarms are really good. It was a good time of the year for it, and I did feed them early on. So we're not going to produce any honey, but we are going to produce 30 deep combs out of that swarm. Most of the swarms that I've caught this year are going to at least give me a double deep worth of comb. That's one of the best things. When you make a shook swarm or when you catch swarms, use them to draw combs for you. They're great at it. They're the perfect age. Everything's going for you when it comes to drawing combs. Um, another time of the year is when you pull honey supers. I don't, I know this, there's some variables here. Some people pull honey supers really late in the year. But how I do it, we're pulling honey supers starting like right now. And when we do that and we've pulled all of them off, the populations are still big. Feed them. Throw a box of foundation on, pull a frame of larvae up and feed them. Go, you know, so we'll have a single brood management, but you, know, you could probably do it with double deeps just fine too. But we do single brood management. So when that's done, all the supers are ripped off, pull the excluder, drop that foundation down, pull up a frame of larvae and feed them thin syrup. And you will get another box of foundation um, drawn. Now you'll have a whole other box of combs. So if you have 10 hives, you can do that on. That's that's 200 drawn combs. That's That's basically how I draw my foundations out. All right, let's see, let's see. Hey, Noah Gaynor, thank you so much for coming on and uh, donating. On, you got a video game controller emoji thing with uh, a broken hand. Man, that's a, that's a really a downer right there. But no, th thanks very much for the donation, very much. Let's see. Fat Bee Man says mineral oil, tea tree, and wintergreen. Huh. Do you think it's better to dip plastic frames or just rub it on by hand? I like rolling. I don't really do a whole lot of plastic frames, but um, foundations or using Pierco or any of that kind of stuff, you could just take a foam roller and roll it on, and that works really good. You can roll, uh, rub it on with a block. I've, I've tinkered around with that, and I think the wax needs to be a certain temperature. The foundation needs to be a certain temperature. If it's too cold, it doesn't seem to rub off very good. And, um, uh, especially, you know, when I'm doing, and I'm not doing one at a time or two at a time. So, um, you could dip them all in. Like if you had a, uh, maybe you're talking about dipping them as far as like stick the whole frame down in there and pull it out. Maybe just do dip it down in there, pull it up and then just shake it off. If you have a whole pot that you can stick it down into. I know some guys do that. I haven't tried that yet. Let's see. Hey, Cayman, my question is about single brood management. Once you have harvested your honey supers, what's your process with all the bees without the supers on? So like I just mentioned, Noah, we are going to throw on a box of foundation. Now, if you have combs or if you have more honey flow, you can just throw more supers on. But we don't have more flow when we take all of ours off. And what we do have is a big population of bees with not a whole lot to do. And we can't mess around either because they're not going to be able to draw a comb very good in August. But if we get to them as soon as we, and we have to feed them. If you yank everything down to a single brood hive, you have to feed the colony unless you have more flow on the way. And some people are like, why don't you leave honey for the bees? Well, we could have, we have a business. We have to run it. Otherwise we have no more business and then we don't have no more bees. And also we leave, we choose our management to leave the fall flow for the bees. And there's other reasons why I feed the bees during summer that's um, give me positive um, gains as well. So we, we pull all the honey supers, throw on a thing of foundation, get that box drawn. You can't have too many combs. And if you end up with too many bees and too many combs, you, you break it down in half and you put a queen in it and you sell it. And it's that easy. 
All right. Let's see. Mm. How do you get the bees to draw medium frames when you only have deeps drawn? Ah, well, that's one of the reasons why having all mediums or having all deeps can be really, really handy. However, I really like having deeps for brood nests, and I do like handling medium honey supers. I love the cost-effective aspect of, of deeps. I don't have the equipment to constantly fool. I pinched a nerve just the other day, and let me tell you, when you're handling lots of deeps by hand, this lift is helping me sometimes. If, if it's really level, the lift does a good job. If it's, if it's nice and level and things are set up for it, the lift does a really nice job. If it's not level, tilting forward too far or tilting back too far, sideways, whatever, or the ground is all over the place, it is a nightmare sometimes. And you have to have two people. Now, Laurel and I work together in the bee yard, so that works out pretty good. But if you're doing mediums and you're doing deeps, then the best thing that I can do is, is suggest that if you have some drawn mediums is that you kind of put a couple of foundations in those drawn combs. Let's say you have only one medium drawn per colony. Well, if there's nine frames in there, which is typically what we run for honey supers, pull three of them out. Actually, what I would do, yeah, I would pull three of them out. So now you have six in there and then take four foundations and I, I stick them in there um, right in the middle and I'm going to come back shortly. So once they start filling up those combs on the side, those foundations, they'll start drawing those foundations there in the center. And you can also stagger them in there. Some people do that. I've done both. And, but what I'll do is I'll come back soon. And then now you can put a box of foundations on once they have started drawing those and put a little bit of nectar, even if they're only part of the way drawn, that's comb to them now. That's their space now. It's not foundations. So they, they treat it differently. Now you can pull those foundations up, and they'll continue to draw those, and then put your those combs that you took out and put them back in. It, ideally, drop the foundations below the combs. You want those foundations um, close to the brood nest. They seem to do better with them if they're closer to the, the brood chambers. All right. Jason, you're welcome very much, and I hope you're doing really good down there in Florida. Sounds like you are, and keep up the good work, uh, especially during this hot, uh, humid weather. And Florida does get humid. Uh, you have to get pretty hardcore sometimes. Actually, one of my bee buddies introduced me to a fan that you can wear inside your bee veil, and I, I tried it out yesterday. It worked pretty good. So I, I may do a little YouTube video on that because it's very inexpensive. And it keeps your face from getting all just sopping wet and sweat dripping in your eyes. It just keeps your face dry. It's pretty nice. And it feels good. I think it lasts three or four hours on a, on a charge. And you just plug it into your wall, your wall or something like that. All right. More questions. <coughs> LaGrange B. Speaking of loading, have you thought about getting an easy loader or making one. Oh, have I ever. <laughs> yes, I have. That's the worst part about watching Ian's videos. I mean to tell you, that easy loader, it's almost a crime how, I mean, when you take that much work out of beekeeping, are you really beekeeping anymore? I mean, come on, seriously. No, that's awesome. Ian's actually going to be at a stand-up straight when he's 70 years old. And, yeah, mine was too, Jason. My suit was drenched. And um, I tell you, I, I hope to get one one of these days or, you know, someone should start making some mid range loaders like that. They, they nothing, you know, as fancy as Ian's You know, that's pretty expensive. But if someone could come out with a, a boom that would actually work and did a good job, that was um, for operations around 30 hives to, you know, could probably handle up to operations of my size around 400. I think they'd sell you know as long as they did it they were made well um of course it takes a good bit of engineering and i'm not you know i you can only do so many things well and i i have no time to f fool with that laurel has the mind for that kind of stuff but she doesn't have the time either unfortunately but easy loader is talking about coming to our conference 
they reached out to me uh, the other day and um, I, we're going to really try to make sure that they come because we've got some big companies coming and that's going to be really good for all of us. And I think it's going to be good for them too, because they're going to get to see you all. And, and let's face it, if you're watching this live chat and you watch my videos on a regular basis, you're pretty hardcore more than likely by a large percentage. I think that's one difference between our channel and some of the other channels, not all of them, but, um, when you're watching our channel, and Bob's channel and Ian's channel, you're, you're pretty s a serious beekeeper or you really love bees, one or the other. Um, it's it's not a kind of halfway thing. So, you know, this that's the thing about this conference and that's the way it was last year. I mean, they're just hardcore beekeepers all over the place. It was cool. All right, all right. Where, where, this thing jumped on me. Hi from Cape Town, South Africa. Oh, this is cool. South Africa, really learning a lot from your videos and would like to know how would you manage a queenless to manage queenless bees? AM, I don't even know how to pronounce that properly, so I'm not going to try. Is our native bee and workers can lay fertilized eggs. Ah, you're inspirational. Thank you very much. So queenless colonies are, are rough and I don't care if you have tons of experience or little experience, sometimes it's really hard to fix a queenless colony. You can purchase mated queens. You can raise your own queens. I don't really know much about the natural behaviors of your particular bee, but I do know when our bees, whether it be um, carnies or Italians or even, you know, Apis mellifera mellifera, you know, they're very similar. And the fact that when they go queenless, you have kind of a, a clock. And the, the longer you go without a queen, the harder it is to get a new one in there. If you recognize it and you still have capped brood in there, even if it's just some, you, that still means that you have had some graduating bees. So you still have some young bees in there and you have more on the way. Those young bees accept queens better and that, that helps a lot. But if it's completely queenless with zero brood and you're talking about your workers can lay fertilized eggs, that, I mean, that's something outside of my expertise. I wish I could help you, but I'm almost confident I'd, I'd mess up. But what we do when they get too far queenless is we consolidate the bees with another hive. And maybe it's a colony that has a really good queen. Let's say if you've watched my videos Let's say we have some colonies that we, we split. It's a six frame colony, five frame, seven frame, something like that. But it has a good queen in there. She's laying good patterns. They're on their way up. But one of the things that's holding them back is they need more population. So that would be a good hive to combine those queenless bees to. Now, if they've got brood in there, we'll drop a queen. If we have a mated queen or better yet, a queen cell. I don't know how your bees do their queen, uh, raising all their queens and stuff, how that works. But queen, uh, queenless colonies do much better with queen cells than they do with mated queens, I find in my personal experience. I'm sorry that wasn't a really great answer for your specific situation, but I, I really can't help with those type of bees. But now I'm going to do some research because that sounds really cool. And maybe one day, um, I can actually see some of those bees in person. That would be fun. Hey, Jackpot John, thank you so much for donating as well. We really appreciate you. Let's see here. Uh, the Cape Honeybee. Okay, that sound, I've, I've heard of those, but I still don't know much about them very much. I will, uh, when I get off of here, I always love reading uh, about any type of pollinator, but especially... Uh, this, this is going to intrigue me quite a bit. So I'm, I'm going to do some research. That doesn't mean I'll know much about your situation, but I'll know more than I did right now. So let's see. What's Ian's channel? It's a Canadian beekeeper's blog. That's what it is. You know, and for a Canadian, he's, he's not too bad to listen to. All right, so if I remove a queen from a honey production colony, will all the nurse bees start gathering honey and lead to a larger harvest quicker? Yes, this can be advantageous. There are some beekeepers that actually purposely go queenless during the flow at certain times. This is all very timed and thought out. 
but yes, you'll take the queen. And what happens is you're raising less brood when you remove the queen because brood stops. And because there's not as much brood to maintain, your nurse bees graduate to foraging age quicker. So you get more foraging bees, but you got to time this. You don't want to do this prior to the flow. You want to you want to do it timed right when you, they're going to graduate right when the prime flow is starting. And that can work. It's a little, I don't really like to fool with it myself. Um, I'm not an expert at it at all, but I have noticed that happening by accident. Colonies will go queenless or supersede at a, a, a good time and make a nice crop of honey still. But I like having bees and I like having brood because uh, it's not all about honey. Honey's not our number one product. We really like producing splits and queens. But there are some books out there that address this. Comb Honey Production, that was done by the Killian family, one of my favorite older books. Still a lot of great information in it. And uh, Honey in the Comb by the Killians. Um, K-I-L-L-I-O-N, Eugene Killian. And it talks about requeening those comb producing colonies for multiple reasons. You get a little bit of that tendency and you also get a fresh queen and fresh queens. Uh, they don't want to swarm with them near as much. <coughs> Excuse me. All right. I don't know. My computer usually has, well, why I'm looking down all the time, which is not normal for me. Usually I have the questions over here on the sidebar and YouTube is doing something funky today. Thank you, YouTube. So I'm actually have I have it on the phone right now. I'm getting to watch your comments here, and so that's why I'm kind of looking down at this. So I'm not texting and ignoring you. I promise. I'm acting like a thirty year old. Okay. Let's see. Cayman, is it normal for bees to be sensitive to being close to the hives after you've gone through them? Yes, it is. I've had a couple buzz the tower and around my face, no stings. Yeah, after you work them, especially at certain times of the year, especially in a dearth period, once you've messed with them, they're they're a little bit more irritable for a couple days afterwards. And that's that's very normal for us. Is there going to be a place to park a semi at the convention? Actually, one of the places that we're looking at, we can drive a semi into the room. Uh, not that we're planning on it. Um, but hey, you never know. I thought about driving Big Red maybe if we did that. Though I could drive Big Red inside the conference and have a bunch of cool stuff to throw off the back of it. Let's see here. Ha, huh, Anita, will the Amish be at the conference with their Cypress boxes? They are nice. Well, I can't seem to get a hold of the Amish on the phone, Anita. I, I, I'm not trying to make fun of you. I'm not, I promise. But um, serious, the Amish won't be willing to do that. But we do have some vendors that do sell their boxes and so their their stuff's going to be there I'm, I'm sure it'll probably be a buck or two higher than what the amish would do it for but um i just don't, i'm not sure uh, i know we'll, ha we'll at least have some of that we're going to have some great diversity i've already talked to multiple vendors they're excited about coming i mean whether it's anything the main thing we're focusing on is the stuff that you all use all the time the stuff we use all the time frames foundation boxes Nice bee veils like the one that I wear. We're going to make sure there's a bunch there. We're also going to make sure that there's pollen sub. There's also and cheap pollen sub. And there's going to be other supplements as well. So we're going to primarily focus on what do beekeepers use the most. You know, bottom boards, lids, that kind of stuff. And we have multiple vendors that make them themselves. So I think we're going to have at least three vendors that it's, it's not like the big companies that are making really nice boxes. And one of them is our sponsor for the experimental yard, Hillco and uh, hat bee acres is planning on being there and they make their stuff. Um, I'm not sure they make all of their stuff. I think they make a lot of the woodenware. Um, so there's going to be multiple options there. We're going to give you plenty of options. And the cool thing is you probably are going to find some vendors that you didn't even know were close to you. And there's a lot of products you're going to be a t-shirt cannon. Uh, I've got a, that would be fun. I'd probably put somebody's eye out. Let's see. Partition. Okay. I got myself lost. 
Picture with Cayman and Big Red sounds like money, sir. Autographed, I would hope. Oh, we w- we're not going to charge money for that kind of stuff. Um, but yeah, we're uh, we're going to have a fun time. That was one of the things I, I talked until I almost lost my voice, and Laura was so pleased the next day. So y'all got to try to do that again, where I I lose my voice. Let's see. Yeah, Hillco boxes are crazy tight. I just showed somebody some of mine from the experimental yard, and he was really impressed. It reminds me of what Man Lake used to be on their boxes. You would never know that now. Yeah, I mean, and, and so we're Hillco has some really good prices, and that's the thing. Oh, that's the biggest problem with these small vendors. They, and it's it's hard, and it's everything in this country has been geared and it's on, it's on purpose. It's geared towards putting out the little companies, whether it's in beekeeping, whether it's in uh, processing, whether it is building equipment, they make it hard on the little guys. They, they really do. But the cool thing is if they're at this conference, you don't pay shipping. They're going to do percentage discounts. They're going to have like one product that we're like, this is something that you have that we like and that, we can do pre-orders on and get you all a big discount. And then they'll, they already have all of these, I mean, you know, it's worth it to them. If we can sell, you know, 500,000 boxes and everybody gets to save and it's good for them because they save that time. You know, it's, it, that's the thing. That's the way we do our business. You know, we don't sell honey one jar at a time. We go bankrupt. We sell it by multiple cases and then they actually sell it to people. And because of that, we're able to focus on what we do best, which is not selling one jar at a time. I'm terrible at that. Oh, I can sell jars of honey one at a time. The problem is I talk to people about bees for 30 minutes a jar. I lose money. And so, you know, Laurel's like, you can't do that anymore. And, and also it just it worked out that way because I was driving a truck with this business. So anyways, we're going to make it cost effective on everybody. But yeah, it's those Hillco boxes are tight. Let's see. Hey, Frank White, we really appreciate that. And um, it's insane. It's been a crazy journey the last couple of years going from zero subscribers and my wife saying you need to do, to do a YouTube channel and me saying, no, it'll never work to where we are now. And by and large, that is because you all have shared our videos and, and because of that, a lot of cool, cool things have happened. And I hope that everyone has been um, helped in their bee yards. And whether it was our information or maybe us saying, hey, you need to check out Bob Benny or you know, check out Ian's video on this or whatever it is that we can help point you in the right direction. It's like this incubator I have right down here on the floor that I had in my last video. Bob did a review on that. I didn't even know beekeepers of his size to use incubators like that. I was fixing to buy a model that costs like three times as much. This thing works great. It doesn't break the bank. I can put a, oh, a little over 200 queens in there if I, if I pack them really tight. And it's fantastic. So since Bob did that YouTube video, I was able to save money and get something from that worked and fitted my fit my needs. And I also have a little bit of reassurance because I really trust Bob. He's a good friend of mine and a great, great beekeeper. So that's the type of stuff we have got to do. We've got to find ways to communicate better in the beekeeping community so that our dollars that we are going to spend, <laughs> you guys are beekeepers too. We spend a lot of money, but we've got to put those dollars in the areas that deserve it. And the areas that are people that care about beekeepers like ourselves and that are going to innovate for us. We need some better products. We need best, better customer service. And we've got to find ways to put our money into those men and women's hands so they can continue to serve us and create for us. And I think that's where YouTube has its greatest potential is because if we can key on those areas, then we can kind of get what we want and more of what we want long term. All right. <laughs> Frank White, I've done nothing but spend money so far. Frank, I really feel your pain. Um, that was th that you pretty much summed up my first 
seven years of beekeeping probably. Now it's not going to take you all seven years. I don't think if you, uh, I think if you, now we have better education and I think people can do what I did in probably a third the time, which is cool. Oxalic acid vaporizer that doesn't break the bank for the backyard beekeeper. Yeah. Well, and, and things have gotten somewhat better in that category for a while. We had John Oliver's vaporizer and now we have the Laura B vaporizer. It still cost money, um, a good bit, but you know, competition can be created all the time. Let's see. Full-time firefighter and woodwork on the side. Building boxes are simple. Not sure why these boxes are sloppy from the big companies. Well, because they can get away with it, apparently. And I think a lot of it's because people buy them. And, th and the reason they're able to is because, like, this is the number one thing that I hear. Like, when I say, hey, this company makes good equipment, they're like, well, the shipping just kills me. These big guys get big discounts on shipping. And they can, they you know, they get bulk prices. And also, when you're selling poor quality stuff, you can sell it probably for cheaper too. But at the same time, you get what you pay for. And a good quality box that's painted well or wax dipped should give you 20 years. But you got to paint it well if you because painting's harder. That's why I love wax dipping. But you can get a painted box to last 20 years, even here in humid Tennessee. You just got to make sure you repaint it every so often and focus on those corners and focus on the edges. Primer really helps with a lot of that. Force it into the, the gaps. There you go. I hear that. Let's see here. Any thoughts on getting Randy Oliver to speak? I had Randy Oliver as a, a virtual speaker last year. And uh, we'll look into that for the future. Um, he keeps really busy. I also know he's having some health problems. Um, so, and California is also extremely strict about everything. I mean, even me talking over this to you, if you're in California, probably is causing you cancer right now. So uh, it's Randy's been a little bit hard to um, you know, get freed up. He's, but that would, a lot of people would like to have Randy there. And he's definitely one of the guys that we have considered getting in person. I asked him last year, but of course, um, California wouldn't let him get out of the state. Um, we are talking to Michael Palmer about it as well, but he has some, um, hangups as well. So, um, with that, but there are some cool things between me and Michael Palmer going on, which will come in the future. Not going to say any more than that. Wow, my wife says if I had a girlfriend or started drinking, it would be cheaper than beekeeping. Could be true. Maybe. Well, and that's again, I'm going to just beat this horse one more time. I know it's a terrible thing to say, but I said it anyways. This conference, I, I firmly believe from talking to, I mean, we're talking from guys that are Businesses that are a couple years old all the way to Data and Man Lake and all of them. And the big guys have their place. We need some big producers out there because if they're doing their job right, they have the money to create stuff like Ultra B Pollen Sub. You know, you're not going to get some bot, you know, some small company making their own pollen sub. More than likely, they just can't afford the equipment. So, but we need the big companies to be held accountable to a degree so they can't sell us garbage. But we're talking to all of them. We're going to get the prices down lower. And what I'm hearing right now, we're going to have some crazy good pricing. Crazy good prices on a lot of stuff. All right, all right. How late in the year should I consider splits in southern Illinois? Ooh, I don't know how cool you drop down, but I would think that, you know, no later than early August, and maybe that might be too late for you. I don't know Illinois that well. I mean, I've been in Southern Illinois a little bit, but the last time I was in Southern Illinois, I was truck driving. This has been several years ago. I was delivering in late January. It was negative nine, and I was unloading freight by hand. Let me tell you, I unloaded at a record-breaking pace because I needed to work as fast as I could to keep my body heat up, and it was cold. So... 
you know your your weather your season better than me and it depends on what the type of split you're doing if you're doing a double deep split down the middle and they're both singles that's pretty good you know you can get them up to size i want to see at least two at least two good brood rounds before those bees start gearing down for winter we need to get plenty of that when you get that queen lane when you get a lot of fresh bees young bees get that a nice winter cluster especially further north you go the more important that is second year seven hives hoping to get four to five hundred pounds of honey this year and recoup my initial investment that would be pretty sweet all right hey carrie mcdaniel thank you so much Came and I put on honey supers about 10 days ago on my hives here in Louisville. Little has been done to them. How long to wait before pulling? Carrie, I have no clue. Um, I don't even know what kind of flows. You you guys might be a month behind me on your flows. You might be two weeks. You might be on the same schedule this year. Maybe you got warmer weather than me. I don't know. Um, that's, that's where if, you know, the YouTube videos can be helpful. They can. But as far as helping you with your local flows and stuff. I have no clue. Mm, I can tell you right now that if someone here in Tennessee puts on a honey super, typically it'll sit there all year long. Uh, well, the rest of the year, and you probably won't even get it filled up. You know, we, we produce honey in Tennessee primarily between early April and the first week of June. And then we're done. I've got records on this year after year after year, and we never produce nectar this time. I've, I've kept pretty good track for 18 years. I've never seen nectar like we have this year, this late. It's almost July. We're shaking nectar out of frames. I cannot believe it. I'm thankful for it. It's kind of throwing my management off big time though, because I'm wanting to pull everything. Usually I strip all the supers at this point, treat colonies, draw foundations out, start making splits. And now I'm behind on all of that stuff. Good problem to have. I'll, I'm not complaining, but um, variables carry lots of variables. So maybe you can find somebody um, locally that can kind of help you with that. WW Outdoors. I used your recipe off of YouTube for my patties. They're eating them up. They love them. Just started. Awesome. Hey, uh, WW Outdoors. Um, was that the patty recipe that used the sugar or is that the one that used the thick syrup? If it's, if it's the sugar one, that was a recipe that was given to me in a, a larger quantity as something that Michael Palmer uses in Vermont. And I took his big batch and I used it for myself and thought, well, a lot of people aren't going to be using, you know, big batches of this. So let's just reduce it down. So Michael Palmer shared it with me. I don't even know if it's actually his or someone that gave it to him, but that's how things work in beekeeping. I mean, goodness, some of this information that I'm, uh, regurgitating, uh, came probably a hundred years ago. You know, some things ha haven't changed very much. Do you know a Vino farm? He's a hobby beekeeper made this very interesting hive design. looks amazing. It's Langstroth base. Yeah. I don't really know, um, Jim very well personally. I've, I've watched a couple of his videos when people have tagged me in them and, or, um, uh, led me to them and said, here's the link, check this out. But, uh, you know, they, they look cool. And then the only thing, with any hive design, and this is one thing we've got horizontal hives going to be at this conference. May, who knows? We might even get Jim to bring one of his hives. It, a lot of people would probably like to meet Jim in person. And, um, uh, you know, we're going to try to have, I know of at least four styles of hives that are different that are going to be at our conference right now. And I'm totally cool with all of it. I was just watching Richard Noel's, um, AZ hive video. No, no. Yeah. Yeah. AZ hive. And I just thought that was really neat. What I don't like, is when people start saying that this is the hive you have to use. And, oh, that the Langstroth hive or this stuff, because it's it's really not true. There are people who l use Langstroth hives in some of the coldest regions, and you, you have to wrap them, you have to insulate them. There's a lot of different things, but let's... We're more concerned about the quality of the bees. Obviously, insulation has its place, and we're learning more about it all the time. But um, Jim's hive looks like it could be really cool and maybe helpful. It looks like it's going to be a little expensive, though. Um, as far as, like, there's a lot of work that goes into that. My hat's off to if he made that or whoever made that. 
But what about extracting those? What about the resell value if you decide to get out of beekeeping or you get too many hives? What if you need to move? There's so there's no such thing as the perfect hive. I think it's cool, but I don't I, I'm not holding my breath thinking that this is going to be some cure for the beekeeping or for the bees or anything like that. Hey, Glenn Copeland, thanks so much for coming on and supporting us yet again. I really appreciate it. Hope things are doing good there at Sasquatch Apiaries. I, I hope you don't have any bears. Maybe Sasquatches don't mess with beehives, but uh, we actually, there was a bear spotted just about uh, 10 miles from my house. Not cool. So we're going to have to consider putting up electric fences around our beehives. Now, there's a good chance, you know, bears have a long roaming radius. And so there's a chance that it was just a young male that was, it's been kicked out and all that kind of stuff. There's, there's variables there, but uh, I don't want to find a yard of 40 colonies sacked. But anyways, was just catching your live chat when I saw you were live. Always good to catch you live. Please put this to use for the gimbal. We will definitely put this to use for, um, we actually already have the gimbal, but there's another, um, thing Laurel's wanting to get for the video quality and i will definitely use it towards that and we really appreciate you glenn hope your season's doing well <clears throat> let's see second year beekeeper but i've dropped 10k in it for good equipment from man lake got another 20k to go Woo! okay you're jumping in fast noah well you know sound like me <laughs> Let's see here. Um, sugar one. All right. Awesome. W outdoors. Yeah, that was a uh, Michael Palmer. Um, I asked him a while back, um, a few years ago. Oh, well, I guess it's been more than a few years ago. Gee, what is time flies? <clears throat> sugar bricks, sugar bricks. Yep. Sugar bricks work good in the winter. I'm a first year beekeeper. Oh man, this thing jumped me. I have a question. How do I know when the summer dearth has started? The bees are still bringing in pollen, but not like a month ago, but still pretty steady. The easiest way to tell if nutrition is lacking in the hive is go in, try to find some young larvae, the type that aren't occupying the entire cell, maybe half of the bottom of the cell, and you should see a pool of jelly behind them. It's not royal jelly. It's a worker blend. They'll get royal jelly when they're really tiny when we graft them, but you need to see a nice pool of jelly behind them. If you're seeing nice pools of jelly, the nutrition's good. If uh, there's less, and this is why I think you should look at, even if you know if it didn't spring, look at all the seasons. Look at the jelly behind the larvae. It tells you a lot. tells you a lot about what's going on. And if you do this over time, you start seeing patterns in your season because of how they're feeding their larvae. And we're talking a normal-looking hive. We're not talking looking at your little split. We're not talking about looking at a queenless hive or one that just got queen right. We're talking about an average nice colony that's why it's nice to have more than a, one or two colonies because when you have you know five or whatever it is you'll have a couple that maybe are behind but you'll have some that this that are really good and so when you see those that are really good you're like this is what the rest of them could be like right now this is the the high end and that's why i usually recommend that beekeepers start, try to you know try to if you can start with three colonies if possible i think three is a good number i think uh, five Five to ten is a, a good size for su sustainability with uh, good management. Um, you can do it with less, but it's trickier. Let's see here. Do you use additives in your sugar syrup? Which do you recommend? I don't for multiple reasons. First, I it's an extra expense that I don't find that it's necessary at all. Bees do extremely well off of just regular sucrose sugar syrup, which that's if you're getting bags of white sugar, that's what it is, sucrose. And the only advantage is to any additives would be, in my opinion, as of right now, would be to prevent the degradation of the syrup. We don't want it to ferment or anything like that. However, I try to make it and use it really fast. But then if I do add something to it, then yeah, you could add some um, Honey Bee Healthy or Pro Health or Man Likes product of Honey Bee Healthy, basically. 
and uh, you could use that. The problem with using those during a dearth period is you can cause robbing even more so. One of the nice things about making one-to-one -one with just regular sh sugar syrup is it doesn't have a really strong smell. Let me tell you, when they find it, they'll still rob the heck out of it. But if you slip it into the colony and get in, get out quick, and you don't spill it, usually there's no problems. But if you have a bunch of honeybee healthy in that or something like that, and the bees have got to it before, they know exactly what that smell is. Bees can remember things like that. And let me tell you, so I don't, I don't like the robbing aspect of of that. And it's especially some of those are really expensive. I don't think it's necessary. So, you know, I have used them in the past. I just, it's, it's an expense. I don't think I need to make. Hey, Cayman, when are you going to sign up for the conference? And that's probably going to be three to four weeks from now. We are like literally deciding in the next couple of days where it is going to be. We're punching some numbers because the problem is where we're at right now is very affordable, but most of the people won't be able to come because it's just, it's not that big and we can't grow there. However, it's really affordable and it's nice, which is hard to come by. And the other places that are bigger and nice are way more expensive. And it's not like we're going to jack the prices up on everybody, a bunch or anything like that. But we also have to make sure that we, you know, if it's a lot bigger, we have to have enough people to be able to, you know, at least break even, you know, all that kind of stuff. So we have to, you know, there's always a risk involved with this kind of stuff. And, oh, we like risks around here, apparently. We seem to do it all the time. Um, but, yeah, sign up probably three to four weeks. Going to try to have it really nice this year. Online sign up. You get email confirmation. That should be pretty immediate. That would be nice on you and nice on us. Are honey competitions still a thing? They are in some locations, especially in big honey producing areas. I'm really not big into that. I used to do a lot of bluegrass mandolin competitions, and it's part of its human nature. But you know, you get these people that show up, and they're and they're good people. But you know, if you're a judge and you know people, you know, you kind of get biased. This fa oh, this family's been doing beekeeping for four generations, and at a certain point i think with all competition there's a, a certain degree of um getting biased now some competitions are really good about making sure nobody knows where this honey comes from all that kind of stuff so i think um i think that could be pretty cool but yeah i really don't get wrapped up in that stuff my honey's not probably the best in the world um but it is one of the best in the world you know that's why i look at it it sells great my bees do exactly what i i want them to do um, I'm proud of what we have. I don't need a competition saying what I am. But that doesn't mean you shouldn't do it. I just, uh, I'm not really into that these days. Um, I've never, I've never actually applied for a, a honey competition, even though I've been in a lot of places that have them. I just, I don't like to fool with it. Let's see here. Questions, questions. <clears throat> How quickly should bees draw out black plastic foundation? Ours seems to be relatively slow. Well, a lot depends on the bees' condition. Is there, are you feeding them or is there a natural flow coming in? So you got to make sure that's there. The bee population's got to be at the right spot. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, also, you got to make sure that there's um, a good wax coat. If there's, um, one of the nice things about having more colonies is that I'm able to get a, a better picture now than you know when i tested things out when i had 20 colonies you could see some differences but when you you're testing out thousands of sheets of foundation at the same time of the year on very similar sized colonies you can kind of get a better representation of how things perform i've drawn out a couple thousand sheets of right cell this year that's man lakes plastic foundation it's got a you know in its defense it has a single coat of beeswax it's very thin and, but it works. They've drawn them out and by and large drawn them out very well, but they were strong colonies during the prime part of the honey flow. If you can't draw foundations, then you can't draw them at any time. However, I've also drawn about 1100 sheets of premier foundation at the same time with, uh, I think I've seen much better performance. They, 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 I have, they, they accept them faster. They draw them faster. But when you get those Premier Foundations, and Premier is going to have a wonderful deal for us. They're one of our sponsors, and they're going to have some pallets of foundation there. 
And let me tell you, you don't have to, you could be a blind man and you'll know that Premier is there because that stuff smells so strong of fresh capping wax that you and the bees are going to love it. And, but the problem is shipping kills you on a lot of stuff like that. So that's again, one of the reasons you got to come to this conference, you save a lot of money. Um, but yeah, you'll see the difference if you actually come um, or if you ever try them out. I got the, the two coats on, on mine. They're the heavy wax. So it's two coats of wax. It's amazing how well they, they drew them out. And it's not because they sponsored me. I'm saying this, they just did so good. I've had really re good results with acorn plastic foundation. That was also heavy waxed. Um, so good, good wax coating is, is really important, but I do like the fact that I get a lot more cells in the premier foundations over the other companies. Let's see here. All right. Well, I'm glad that T Hill, Tony, I'm, I'm glad that helped you out. Can we mark on your calendar the next conference? Um, yeah. So January 7th and 8th, 2022. I've already got Bob, Ian, Stepler, many great speakers. They are going to be there. And as long as the Canadians let Ian fly down and uh, it, it's, it's going to be great. Seventh and eighth. And I will have more information on this channel when it breaks that you can register. And um, I think last year, we had 150 people sign up in under two weeks. So just uh, keep that in mind. And it was, you know, last year and a lot of people weren't signing up for obvious reasons. So I don't know what to expect this year, but it's going to be hopping, I think. All righty then. Cayman, how are your... Bob Benny Queens doing got 26 of them. Just like to hear your opinion. Well, you know, these are Bob Benny Queens, but they're, they're his genetics, but they're raised down in, um, a couple places. I can't remember. Yeah. They're both raised in Florida. One's by the Knox fella and one's by Chris Warner. And so I, the ones that I got were from Chris Warner. They've done really good. They're a little bit more edgy than my bees. They're not real bad. It's not like they're mean or anything. It's not like Weaver Queens or anything like that, but they they are a little bit more aggressive than mine. But they're not they're not too bad. They've laid really good for me. I've, I've been pleased with what I've seen, and uh, but that was the, that was the Warner Warner batch. And uh, you know they're they're carnies. I like to try new stuff every year, especially from people like Bob or Michael Palmer or somebody like that that I feel like is not just blindly selecting for queens they they actually are, are trying to better their stock and i i really like what i've seen so far the conference will be in tennessee we're looking at a couple different places lebanon looking at um, severeville looking at murfreesboro nashville all kinds of places definitely more on the central to eastern side of the state Can you attend the conference to buy products if you can't attend due to space? I don't know if we would be able to work that or not. Um, probably not. Maybe um, the vendors, however, though, might work with you on that. They might uh, they might be willing to to like meet you outside or something like that. Uh, so uh, that's uh, that they might be willing to do that. I have no clue. Well, I'll think about that one. A lot of people are asking if it is going to be filmed. I'm going to, we're looking right now into a company to professionally film this and have that available. Speaking about conferences, will you be at the TBA conference in October? Yes, I will. I am one of the, the speakers there. And um, also I'll be doing a segment with Kent Williams on queen rearing. So that's going to be a lot of fun because Kent and I do things a little bit differently, but um, um, Kent definitely has raised queens for a long time. And uh, also Randy McCaffrey, the dirt rooster, um, sounds like he's threatening to show up as well. So be forewarned. I know now why you do plastic foundations, less work. Oh my goodness. We'll see. And I was a new beekeeper at one time. I used to try to reinvent the wheel. Plastic foundations, you don't have to use them. You can use wax foundation. I used to put in deep wax foundation and then I'd have to cross wire them so they wouldn't blow out in my extractor and, and lose my combs. 
with the plastic, you never have that happen. At least I never had any of mine do that. And I can just literally pop them in. And the nice thing is I can, I have so much wax. I can just, if I feel like I want to coat them more, or if I get a good deal on some thin wax coated, something, another from some company, which I'll get from time to time, I'll just dip them in our wax and they're ready to go. It's just a saves me so much work, so much work. Where can we get the info on all these conferences? Um, I will be posting more information on all of these, Frank. Um, it's We are working hard on them. Um, we're just now really starting to, to prep to get that information out to you all. But it's been hard. It's just a rough season to be able to keep up with all that. Um, but we, I've got some guys that are um, helping me. Appalachian Angel, have you seen Better Comb by Better Bees? It seems like a good option for beginners that don't have drawn comb. I think it is. I mean, it's a little bit to invest into it, but I think it could still be worth the investment, though. Um, I would recommend watching Dansky's Bees videos on it or Frederick Dunn's videos on Better Comb. It does need to be wired in. Otherwise, it will sag on you. But I think using it for brood combs could be advantageous, especially if you are a new beekeeper. It's something to consider. Better Bee is one of the companies that we are really working hard to try to get them down here. They have unique products that other bee companies don't have, but some of these companies do not do a lot of these things. So one of the things that would be helpful from you all, if there's somebody that you want there, let them know. Send them an email. Give them a call. Let them know about our conference. Just say Hive Life Conference, Cayman Reynolds, January 7th and 8th. You can uh, message me at tennesseesbees at gmail.com. And, you know, I think it's going to be good for them, too. I mean, there's no and no doubt in my mind. I mean, I think that they're going to be able to sell product. But if we can get them out there, that's where you can probably get a deal on better coma. If we can get better be out there. And say, this is where I'm talking with these companies. If we get pre-orders on drawn better comb. We buy, we get, you know, a bunch of people together, buy 500 of them. Just think they'll give us a discount on that. They're happy to do it. Larry Lee's bees. Hope things are going good for you in Washington, Larry. Hey, Cam, we are hitting triple digits for the next 10 days. Should I be pulling the honey supers and supplementing with syrup or leave the honey for the girls and hope for a fall flow? Thanks for all you do. Man, I don't know what your your season's like. Or if you guys are already done producing honey and they're capped and ready to be pulled, then I don't see why you should wait. But if you have more flow to go and you have there's more space in there that you think they can fill up, then, then wait a little bit. Um I would just, obviously, you try to keep the gals as cool as possible. Put something on top of those lids and try to give them a little bit of shade if possible, even if it's just shading the lid itself and creating a little bit of uh, air movement. A lot of times, I'll just take one of my migratory lids and flip it upside down, give it some shade and some air movement. Thanks again for donating, Larry. I appreciate that. Um, yeah, you, you looked a lot different with the beard, though. It looks like the... Uh, your woman uh, decided to, that she didn't, she didn't like the beard anymore and <laughs> got you to hack it off. We really wish you'd cover your face back up. But, you know, she's the boss. <clears throat> Let's see here. Yeah. I, I have a friend who has 42 beehives, white boxes. He also has a white garage building to park his truck, and he called me up there, and all his beats was on his building he took smoke to get them home to his hives huh that sounds really interesting i wonder if he just moved them or something that was, that's interesting so jackpot john says on better comb i only use it for brood if you don't embed it on wire it will sag in hot climates and that's what i've heard from multiple beekeepers and youtubers and so um, definitely need to wire that in. Frederick Dunn has a great system on easily wiring that in, and uh, that would be pretty good. Cayman, nobody talks about labels and labeling. A label vendor would be great. P H Peter Hicks, thank you so much for that. I had not even thought about that at all, and that's why people like you have got to speak up because I, I've, I've 
just don't think about a lot of these things. And that would be cool if we could get a company that specializes in really cool labels. I'm not talking necessarily even a B company, just a company that specializes in making cost effective labels. Maybe a representative from like Sticker Giant. One of my buddies who owns a coffee shop around here gets all of his labels from Sticker Giant. And I'm looking at doing that myself. He says they're really great to work with, fast and affordable, and the labels are good. So, who knows? Maybe I could get someone like that, or maybe we can find a beekeeping company. Or shoot, maybe one of our subscribers does that and does it well. It doesn't matter to me. The main thing is we need quality. And when it comes to vendors, we're not going to have like a hundred or something here, even if we could fit them. There's not probably that many good vendors, and we don't want a lot of overlap because we don't make sure that our good vendors, you know, do well also. So they'll come back the next year and be successful. We're going to, just like with everything else we do, it's, it's a focus on quality over quantity. But definitely appreciate that suggestion. I literally just wrote that down. So we will do our best to have a label person. I'm going to elaborate on this a little bit so Laurel can read my handwriting. All right. So thank you, Garrett B Company, once again. Hope you're doing well. Thanks for the live chat. Always busy. Honestly, haven't watched you much. Uh, uh. Uh, ouch so busy wish you the best i'm getting burned out not as fun as five years ago long story i know you know what i mean garrett b man i know exactly what you're talking about that is one of the risks that you take when you start doing what he's doing what we have done and we're still doing whenever you turn it into a serious sideline or a business you can turn it into a monster and the growing pains are rough some years are rough and just not gentle on your bees or you. And this time of the year, it's hot and it's sweaty. I mean, you just, especially when I was working a full-time job, it's still that way. I haven't gone through as much beekeeping burnout, but that is a real thing. A lot of beekeepers, and I'm talking about beekeepers that are not just running 20 hives. I'm talking some guys running a lot more hives than I am. And they go through beekeeping burnout because it's just, it, it's taxing on your adrenals, your electrolytes, especially if you're out in this hot weather. And the bees, you know, the same way with the bees during summer. It's rough on them, too. That's why we try to do what we can to help them out and take care of them. We try to give them the best conditions we can as good beekeepers. But beekeeping burnout is a real thing. And uh, take it easy, Garrett. Just just realize that, uh, you know, we go through that and a lot of other guys do, too, and gals. And uh, hang in there. But you got to rest. You, you got to rest. I've learned that the hard way. Ooh, can you give us poor beekeepers a lead on where we can buy queens? I can't afford $40 queens. That is a question I have not no good answer to. The prices of queens just keep going up. And the quality of queens is not going up with the price. This is why I push and encourage so much to raise your own. And if you can't do that, encourage somebody locally to do it. Even if... Learn how to use cells. I showed these earlier. I'm going to show them again. I'll just show a little bit of them. Well, I'm just going to show this one. So we got some queen cages, um, not queen cages, some queen cells. And these are queen cell protectors, JZBZ system. And, you know, if you can find someone locally that can do this, raising queen cells is not that hard. Um, once, once you learn how to do it, you can raise a ton of queen cells, having enough mating nukes for them and having enough bees for all the mate for the Queens. That's the trick and having the time to fool with all of them. But if you can get someone to raise queen cells, learn more people need to learn how to use queen cells properly. And you know, you're not going to get a hundred percent takes, but even if you can pay, you know, let's say you get a queen cell for seven bucks, you can, you can get a lot of Queens for $40. But there's not a good answer on that one, uh, Frank. Um, the queen prices are just going up. Shipping prices are going up. Unless you know somebody personally, I don't like buying queens because it's awful. Most of the time I spend a lot of money and I don't get queens near as good as what I can do myself. There's a few exceptions to that rule, but those guys that do that, they are so far booked out and it's so hard to get them when they need them because they only produce a small time of the year. It's a, it's a frustrating situation. Learning how to raise your own queens is one of the best things you can do. 
YouTube burnout as well. <laughs> uh, yes, absolutely. I haven't posted near as many videos the last couple of weeks. And there's a lot of reasons for that. Beekeeping burnout and just not having enough time. Cayman Sticker Mule is a good label and sticker company. I'll have to look into that too. Exactly. I mean, and let me tell you, I understand, you know, people, when you're working a full-time job and then you've got to manage a bunch of colonies, it, it's insane. And then, you know, if you don't have enough time for your kids during that time of the season, which typically you don't, if you, if you're like me, you feel bad as a father and then that yeah, puts, you know, then that stress is just all forms of stress. And then especially the people in your life, and you just got to ignore these people that say, why don't you just stick to your day job and just keep it at a hobby level, Cayman? I don't know how many times I heard that. Keep it, you know, just stay in your lane, basically is what they're saying. You know, don't don't get any special ideas. You're really not that special, Cayman. And I'm really not. I just didn't give up. And we went through a lot of craziness and burnouts and stress and eyes twitching for months on end because our bodies were shot. But that's what it takes a lot of times. Ah, just bought a new vintage jacket. What a difference. Well, you know, those vintage jackets feel pretty hot, but once you, you throw one that's not vented on, you can, you can really tell the difference. All right, all right. Let's see. Hey, John Hatch, thanks for coming on. Take care up there up north. Hey, Mr. Stan. Hey, Cayman. How's the Appa May yard doing? You still a fan? Pluses and minuses. I love them. The Appa May boxers are doing great. Bees in them are doing fantastic. You know, the wooden hives are doing fantastic, too. If you watched my video this morning, obviously, those bees in those wooden hives are doing pretty good. They obviously beard a lot more in those wooden hives than they do in the Appa May hives. Pros and cons. Pros and cons. I think that there's a lot of advantages with the Appa May hives, but you know, then you have to weigh the cost into that. And some people don't want to use those type of hives. So I, I definitely don't think if you buy an Appa May hive, it's because some people are like, Oh, that's such a gimmick. I don't believe, I don't believe that at all, but I don't believe you need to, you just have to use them either. So it's not, I think it's, it's safe to say though, it's a good product. You know, some people won't want to spend that money. And I can tell you right now, I'm not planning on switching all of my colonies over to it. I can't afford to, um, but, and I don't, and I don't need to, but at the same time, we're going to learn a lot more about these things in the experimental yard. And especially once we go through winter with 26 of them or whatever survives to winter, that's going to be really interesting to see. I'm, I'm excited because we're really close to the part where, we're going to start uh, doing the alcohol washes and then, and then doing the treatments. And that's, that's really the nuts and bolts of this experimental yard. I've got some video footage that we're editing and, and going to have up sometime this, this week on the experimental yard, giving you updates. And I just secured a control yard that is a safe distance away from all of my bee yards. So the control yard, if the mite loads get really high and I don't know of any other beekeepers in that area, then we're not going to have to worry about drifting into our other colonies, especially the other experimental colonies, because we definitely don't want to contaminate those and mess up the, the numbers. And I do plan on not just letting them crash because I don't, there could be some beekeepers nearby and I definitely don't want to be crashing their hives because of our experimental yard. That's very irresponsible. So what we're going to do is do some alcohol washes again on those later in August and, I'm sure that they're going to be quite high probably in the early September. Like, okay, this is unsustainable. You can see it. Here's the numbers. We're also keeping records right now. There's been a couple colonies that have swarmed. I've had two colonies out of the 52 that have swarmed and I've had, I'll have to check my notebook, but I've had at least two, maybe three colonies that have superseded their Queens. That's going to be written down on these colonies. So when you look at hive number 22 in its chart, you're going to see, okay, this one's superseded. Uh, at this state. And that way, if maybe there's a hiccup in the mite population there, Oh, okay. They swarmed that they shed some mites in, with swarm, which is more than likely. So we tr we're trying to keep them all together, but there is some variables happening and that's just, you're experiencing variables in your bee yards right now. 
but yeah, Stan, the, 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 the Appamaze are doing really good. Hey, Steve, thanks for coming on. Thanks so much for your support. We really appreciate you and have a good night. All right, let's see here. Mm. Wow, this thing, you guys have dropped a lot of questions. I'm putting this form box at my son's house. He lives near Cayman, but if Cayman wants them back, that's okay. No, 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 no. That's that's all good. If uh, if I shoot out any swarms, that's whoever gets them gets them. That's my problem. That's the way I look at it too. If, if someone shoots a swarm and it goes off of their property and somebody grabs them, then you should have kept your bees from swarming. That's your fault. Um, but yeah, I'm, I send out swarms. That's for sure. And then you know they go out and get in a tree, and hopefully they'll survive. Maybe and send out a swarm the next year swarm traps are good though i would definitely have some more swarm traps out next year all right there's a guy just on here talking about a place that gives away queen bees come back tell us again <laughs> wow b club leader gives them away that's really cool are we you know, and I think this is where the, the two day queen cell thing, I think probably has its the most merits is if you had somebody who raised queen cells, you could literally have <clears throat> a ton of two day queen cells. And if you had a good system, you, of course, you'd have to educate the people who got them, but then you could take those home and you could raise queens with uh, the two day queen cell like that. I think queen cells um, need to be utilized more. Hey, Walter, thank you so much. I'm, I'm glad that you've learned a lot and I'm uh, glad that it's helped. So, Jason, thank you so much again for helping us out. You bought three ventilation sections from Man Lake. They're two inch high, got eight one inch holes covered with metal screens. Is this a waste or will it help with ventilation? It'll definitely help with ventilation. I know some guys really like them. Um, I don't know, Jason, if you follow Bob Benny's channel, it would probably be a good use of your time. Bob's a really smart guy. Really smart beekeeper. He did a video recently with um, Dick Brickner. And I don't think, I don't know if what Dick is using is the same as what you're describing, but it's very similar to what you're describing. And on the top, I think, I think he makes his own homemade shims though, but it's similar and it goes up on top and he feels like if the bees make a crazy good crop and they surpass the honey supers and need more room to draw comb, they'll draw some up there and it gives them a little bit of relief so they don't backfill the brood nest and swarm it also gives them more ventilation to ripen out the nectar and he feels like that really helps him out i don't use that on my operation because that's a lot of spare pieces of equipment for hundreds of hives but oh, i can't remember the book there's a guy in california it's an older book but he has some of the records for honey production um, in the country big massive honey yields and he'd have huge um, landing boards on the entrance so the, the bees could blow a lot of air through them. He'd have ventilation up top. He'd had all kinds of um, anything he felt like he could do to help the bees bring in that crop quick and dehydrate it down as fast as possible. And, um, you know, so you may be able to make those yourself, Jason, or find somebody um, at a cheaper price, but um, that might be, uh, might, that, that ventilation might help you out a good bit. I, I don't know. A lot of opinions on that. Do you have a preference preference on plastic frames or waxed foundation for honey supers? Um, you know, some people, you know, one guy actually called me out and said, man, you know, I really hate that you use plastic foundation. I'm a purist. And, you know, he called me out on YouTube and oh, I felt so, so terrible. Um, no, what I keep doing the plastic foundation because I love it and I can coat my own wax on it and it still works good. You can use wax foundation, but if you use wax foundation, if it's hot, it's going to bow. You need to cross wire it. It's not enough to have the wires going up and down. In my opinion, you need to cross wire it to make it stronger for extraction speeds. Also, um, I don't like how, if you don't do that, a lot of times they'll cup on you. And so every single one of them in there will cup a certain direction a lot of times, or sometimes one will cup this way and one will cup this way and you'll have hardly any comb right here and fat combs on one side. You don't get that with plastic foundation. So I, I like plastic foundation and you can just literally it's in and it's done and it's good. Now you can spend more time doing something else. 
Yeah, the bearding is brutal trying to help. Well, a lot of that is due to your humidity, Jason, and uh, it's it's hard to to deal with that, but your, that ventilation should help a, a degree. Yeah, I wax foundation. I mean, like there's there's certain things that I really do not like doing in beekeeping or I hate. And the top of the hate list is Varroa mites. Pretty easy, low hanging fruit there. After that is wiring in wax foundation. Now they have some, Frederick Dunn has some videos on this where you can get an embedder and it heats up the wires and uh, it, it really is a lot faster. So if you're gonna do a lot of natural wax foundation, which is great. I'm not saying that you're an idiot for doing it. I'm just telling you why I don't like it. And if you're, but if you're going to do a lot of that, get the embedder. I don't care if you have to borrow the money, it's worth the time savings. And uh, the other thing I hate doing is painting boxes. Man, I hate painting. Those three things right there, hate it. Let's see. Garlic and honey with cinnamon. Okay, this this is something. I'm, I'm looking at some of these. And it's fine. I, I'm fine that people are having conversations on here. Frederick Dunn says he doesn't use vents anymore due to bees propolizing it closed. Yeah, and a lot of times bees will do that. Um, There is a guy on Bee Source, Jason, that sells really nice wax. And I've, I purchased from him before. And man, I cannot remember. Honey Householder, I think, on Bee Source. It's a forum for beekeepers. It's kind of old-fashioned and boring to a degree. There's, but there is some good stuff on there. And one of the things is, is Honey Householder's on there. And I, th I think he sells a reasonable price for his beeswax. Let's see. Mm -hmm. Well... I think that we are going to call it a night. Oh my goodness, we've been on here two and a half hours. I appreciate everybody joining. It's been a lot of fun. It's been a while since we've done this. Um, I hope I've been able to answer a pretty good bit of questions and give you some food for thought. Don't forget all this stuff that's fixing to happen. Um, I told Laurel I'd try to keep it around an hour and a half, and I, I haven't been checking the time. We're two and a half hours in, so whoops. But I hope you all are doing well, and thanks for watching the videos. Thanks for the comments and questions and the suggestions. And follow me on Facebook if you if you do Facebook. I understand if you don't. But if you are on there, follow me. I don't really accept friend requests because it's, it's too much work for me because I get to see everything that you do. If you post about when you're eating breakfast at this restaurant, I get to see that. So if you follow me, I don't have to see all that. And it's just so I can keep my business on my page very efficient. So I don't ac accept friend requests anymore, but I, if you will hit the follow button, which is next to it, then you get to see everything that I post. So if you're wanting to know about the conference, about when we're selling singles of bees, which are going to be strong, young colonies that are going to be in great shape and should be ready for that fall flow to build up some more. Or if you want to know about anything else, or if you have suggestions on what you'd like to see at the conference, um, you can always mention in a comment on a YouTube video. Um, send an email to me at tennesseesbees at gmail.com. That's Tennessee with an S on the end of it, B-E-E-S at gmail.com. And I try to get back to all those that I can. I'm not always able to get back to you, but a lot of times I see it. I just, I can't get back to everybody. Just too many comments. So anyways, thank you so much. Keep in touch and God bless you. We'll see you later.